The Terror by Arthur Machen Chapter One The Coming of the Terror after two years we are turning once more to the morning's news with a sense of appetite and glad expectation there were thrills at the beginning of the war the thrill of horror and of a doom that seemed at once incredible and certain this was when namur fell and the german host swelled like a flood over the french fields and drew very near to the walls of paris then we felt the thrill of exultation when the good news came that the awful tide had been turned back, that Paris and the world were safe, for a while at all events. Then for days we hoped for more news as good as this or better. Has von Kluck been surrendered? Not today, but perhaps it will be surrendered tomorrow. But the days became weeks, the weeks drew out to months, the battle in the west seemed frozen. Now and again things were done that seemed hopeful, with promise of events still better. But Neuve Champel and Luce dwelled into disappointments as their tale was told fully. The lies in the West remained, for all practical purposes of victory, immobile. Nothing seemed to happen. There was nothing to read save the record of operations that were clearly trifling and insignificant. People speculated as to the reason of this inaction, the hopeful said that Joffre had a plan that he was nibbling. Others declared that we were short of munitions. Others again that the new levies were not yet ripe for battle. So the months went by, and almost two years of war had been completed before the motionless English line began to stir and quiver as if it awoke from a long sleep and began to row onward, overwhelming the enemy. The secret of the long inaction of the British armies has been well kept. On the one hand, it was rigorously protected by the censorship, which severe, and sometimes severe to the point of absurdity, the captains and the depart, for instance, became in this particular matter ferocious. As soon as the real significance of that which was happening, or beginning to happen, was perceived by the authorities, an underlined circular was issued to the newspaper proprietor of great britain and ireland it warned each proprietor that he might impart the contents of this circular to one other person only such person being the responsible editor of his paper he was to keep the communication secret under the severest penalties the circular forbade any mention of certain events that had taken place that might take place it forbade any kind of allusion to these events or any hint of their existence, or of the possibility of their existence, not only in the press, but in any form whatever. The subject was not to be alluded to in conversation. It was not to be hinted at, however obscurely, in letters. The very existence of the circular, its subject apart, was to be a dead secret. These measures were successful. A wealthy newspaper proprietor of the North warmed a little at the end of the thrusters' fist, which was held as usual, it will be remembered, ventured to say to the man next to him how awful it would be, wouldn't it, if... His words were repeated as proof, one regrets to say, that it was time for old Arnold to pull himself together, and he was fined a thousand pounds. Then there was the case of an obscure weekly paper published in the county town of an agricultural district in Wales. The Myros Observer, we would call it, was issued from a stationer's back premises and filled its four pages with accounts of local flower shows, fancy fairs at vicarages, reports of parish councils and rare bathing fatalities it also issued a visitor's list which has been known to contain six names this enlightened organ printed a paragraph which nobody noticed which was very like paragraphs that small country newspapers have long been in the habit of printing which could hardly give so much as a hint to any one to any one that is who was not fully instructed in the secret as a matter of fact this piece of intelligence got into the paper because the proprietor, who was also the editor, incautiously left the last processes of this particular issue to the staff, 
he was the lord high everything else of the establishment and the star put in a bit of gossip he had heard in the market to fill up two inches on the back page but the result was that the mayor's observer ceased to appear owing to untoward circumstances as the proprietor said and he would say no more no more that is by way of explanation but a great deal more by way of execration of damned prime busybodies now a censorship that is sufficiently minute and utterly remorseless can do amazing things in the way of hiding what it wants to hide before the war one would have thought otherwise one would have said that censor or no censor the fact of the murder at x or the fact of the bank robbery at y would certainly become known if not through the press at all events through rumour and the passage of the news from mouth to mouth and this would be true of england three hundred years ago and of savage tribelands of to-day but we have grown of late such a preference for the printed word and such a reliance on it that the old faculty of disseminating news by a word of mouth has become atrophied forbid the press to mention the fact that jones has been murdered and it is marvellous how few people will hear of it and of those who hear how few will credit the story that they have heard you meet a man in the train who remarks that he has been told something about a murder in southwark there is all the difference in the world between the impression you receive from such a chance communication and that given by half a dozen lines of print with name and street and date and all the facts of the case people in trains repeat all sorts of tales many of them false newspapers do not print accounts of murders that have not been committed then another consideration that has made for secrecy i may have seemed to say that the old office of rumour no longer exists i shall be reminded of the strange legend of the russians and the mythology of the angels of mons but let me point out in the first place that both these absurdities depended on the papers for their wide dissemination if there had been no newspapers or magazines russians and angels would have made but a brief vague appearance of the most shadowy kind a few would have heard of them fewer still would have believed in them they would have been gossiped about for a bare week or two and so they would have vanished away and then again the very fact of these vain rumours and fantastic tales having been so widely believed for a time was fatal to the credit of any stray mutterings that may have got abroad people had been taken in twice they had seen how grave persons men of credit had preached and lectured about the shining forms that had saved the british army at mons and had testified to the trains packed with grey-coated muscovites rushing through the land at dead of night and now there was a hint of something more amazing than either of the discredited legends but this time there was no word of confirmation to be found in daily paper or weekly review or parish magazine and so the few that had either laughed or being serious went home and jotted down nooks for essays on wartime psychology collective delusions i followed neither of these courses for before the secret circular had been issued my curiosity had somehow been aroused by certain paragraphs concerning a fatal accident to well-known airmen the propeller of the airplane had been shattered apparently by collision with a flight of pigeons the blades had been broken and the machine had fallen like lead to the earth and soon after as in this account i heard of some very odd circumstances relating to an explosion in the great munition factory in the midlands i thought i saw the possibility of a connection between two very different events it has been pointed out to me by friends who have been good enough to read this record the certain phrases i have used may give the impression that i ascribe all the delays of the war on the western front to the extraordinary circumstances which occasioned the issue of the secret circular of course this is not the case there were many reasons for the immobility of our lines from october nineteen fourteen to july nineteen sixteen these causes have been evident enough and have been openly discussed and deplored but behind them was something of infinitely greater moment we lacked men 
but men were pouring into the new army who were short of shells but when the shortage was proclaimed the nation set itself to mend this matter with all its energy we could undertake to supply the defects of our army both in men and munitions if the new and incredible danger could be overcome it has been overcome rather perhaps it has ceased to exist and the secret may now be told i have said my attention was attracted by an account of the death of a well-known airman i have not a habit of preserving cuttings i am sorry to say so that i cannot be precise as to the date of this event to the best of my belief it was either towards the end of may or the beginning of june nineteen fifteen the newspaper paragraph announcing the death of flight lieutenant western reynolds was brief enough accidents and fatal accidents to the men who are storming the air for us are unfortunately by no means so rare as to demand an elaborated notice but the manner in which western reynolds met his death struck me as extraordinary inasmuch as it revealed a new danger in the elements that we have lately conquered it was brought down as i said by a flight of birds of pigeons as appeared by what was found on the blood-stained and shattered blades of the propeller an eye-witness of the accident a fellow officer described how western reynolds set out from the aerodrome on a fine afternoon there being hardly any wind he was going to france he had made the journey to and fro half a dozen times or more and felt perfectly secure and at ease westerns rose to a great height at once and we could scarcely see the machine i was turning to go when one of the fellows called out i say what's this he pointed up and we saw what looked like a black cloud coming from the south at a tremendous rate i saw at once it wasn't a cloud it came with a swirl and a rush quite different from any cloud i've ever seen but for a second i couldn't make out exactly what it was it altered its shape and turned into a great crescent and wheeled and veered about as if it was looking for something the man who had called out had got his glasses and was staring for all he was worth then he shouted that it was a tremendous flight of birds thousands of them they went on wheeling and beating about high up in the air and we were watching them thinking it was interesting but not supposing that they would make any difference to wester who was just about out of sight his machine was just a spake then the two arms of the crescent drew in as quick as lightning and these thousands of birds shot in a solid mass right up there across the sky and flew away somewhere about nor nor by west then haney the man with the glasses called out he's dumb and started running and i went after him we got a car and as we were going along haney told me that he'd seen the machine drop dead as if it came out of that cloud of birds he thought then that they must have mucked up the propeller somehow that turns out to be the case we found the propeller blades all broken and covered with blood and pigeon feathers and carcasses of the birds had got wedged in between the blades and were sticking to them this was the story that the young airman told one evening in a small company he did not speak in confidence so i have no hesitation in reproducing what he said naturally i did not take a verbatim note of his conversation but i have something of a knack of remembering talk that interests me and i think my reproduction is very near to the tale that i heard and let it be noted that the flying man told his story without any sense or indication of a sense that the incredible or all but the incredible had happened so far as he knew he said it was the first accident of the kind airmen in france had been bothered once or twice by birds he thought they were eagles flying viciously at them but poor old wester had been the first man to come up against a flight of some thousands of pigeons and perhaps i shall be the next he added but why look for trouble anyhow i'm going to see Tudo to-morrow afternoon well i heard the story as one hears all the varied marvels and terrors of the air as one heard some years ago of air pockets strange gulfs or voids in the atmosphere into which airmen fell with great peril or as one heard of the experience of the airman who flew over the cumberland mountains in the burning summer of nineteen eleven 
and as he swam far above the heights was suddenly and vehemently blown upwards the hot air from the rock striking his plane as if it had been a blast from a furnace chimney we have just begun to navigate a strange region we must expect to encounter strange adventures strange perils and here a new chapter in the chronicles of these perils and adventures had been opened by the death of western reynolds no doubt invention and contrivance would presently hit on some way of countering the new danger it was i think about a week or ten days after the airman's death that my business called me to a northern town the name of which perhaps had better remain unknown my mission was to inquire into certain charges of extravagance which had been laid against the working people that is the munition workers of this especial town it was said that the men who used to earn two pounds ten shillings a week were now getting from seven to eight pounds that bits of girls were being paid two pounds instead of seven or eight shillings and that in consequence there was an orgy of foolish extravagance the girls i was told were eating chocolates at four five and six shillings a pound the women were ordering thirty pound pianos which they couldn't play and the men bought gold chains at ten and twenty guineas apiece i dived into the town in question and found as usual that there was a mixture of truth and exaggeration in the stories that i had heard gramophones for example they cannot be called in strictness necessaries but they were undoubtedly finding a ready sale even in the more expensive brands and i thought that there were a great many very spick and span perambulators to be seen on the pavement smart perambulators painted in tender shades of colour and expensively fitted and how can you be surprised if people will have a bit of a fling a worker said to me we are seeing money for the first time in our lives and it's bright and we work hard for it and we risk our lives to get it you've heard of explosion yonder he mentioned certain works on the outskirts of the town of course neither the name of the works nor of the town had been printed there had been a brief notice of explosion at munition works in the northern district many fatalities the working man told me about it and added some dreadful details they wouldn't let their folks see the bodies screwed them up in coffins as they found them in shop the gas had done it turned the faces black you mean nay they were all as if they had been bitten to pieces this was a strange gas i asked the man in the northern town all sorts of questions about the extraordinary explosion of which he had spoken to me but it had very little more to say as i have noted already secrets that may not be printed are often deeply kept last summer there were very few people outside high official circles who knew anything about the tanks of which we have all been talking lately so if these strange instruments of war were being exercised and tested in a park not far from london so the man who told me of the explosion in the munition factory was most likely genuine in his profession that he knew nothing more of the disaster i found out that he was a smelter employed at a furnace on the other side of the town to the ruined factory he didn't know even what they had been making there some very dangerous high explosive he supposed his information was really nothing more than a bit of gruesome gossip which he had heard probably at third or fourth or fifth hand the horrible detail of faces as if they had been bitten to pieces had made his violent impression on him that was all i gave him up and took a tram to the district of the disaster a sort of industrial suburb five miles from the centre of the town when i asked for the factory i was told that it was no good my going to it as there was nobody there but i found it a raw and hideous shed with a ward yard about it and a shut gate i looked for signs of destruction but there was nothing the roof was quite undamaged and again it struck me that this had been a strange accident there had been an explosion of sufficient violence to kill work people in the building but the building itself showed no wounds or scars a man came out of the gate and locked it behind him i began to ask him some sort of question or rather i began to open for a question 
with a terrible business here, they tell me, or some such phrase of convention. I got no farther. The man asked me if I saw a policeman walking down the street. I said I did, and I was given the choice of getting about my business forthwith or of being instantly given in charge as a spy. Thest better be gone and quick about it, was, I think, his final advice, and I took it. Well, I had come literally up against a brick wall. Thinking the problem over, I could only suppose that the smelter or his informant had twisted the phrases of the story. The smelter had said the dead man's faces were bitten to pieces. This might be an unconscious perversion of eaten away. That phrase might describe well enough the effect of strong acids, and for all I knew of the processes of munition making, such acids might be used and might explode with horrible results in some perilous stage of their admixture. It was a day or two later that the accident of the airman, Western Reynolds, came into my mind. For one of those instants, which are far shorter than any measure of time, there flashed out the possibility of a link between the two disasters. But here was a wild impossibility, and I drove it away. And yet, I think that the thought, mad as it seemed, never left me. It was the secret light that at last guided me through a sombre grove of enigmas. It was about this time, so far as the date can be fixed, that a whole district, one might say a whole county, was visited by a series of extraordinary and terrible calamities, which were the more terrible inasmuch as they continued for some time to be inscrutable mysteries. It is, indeed, doubtful whether these awful events do not still remain mysteries to many of those concerned. For before the inhabitants of this part of the country had time to join one link of evidence to another, the secular was issued, and thenceforth no one knew how to distinguish undoubted facts from wild and extravagant surmise. The district in question is in the far west of Wales, I shall call it for convenience, Marion. In it there is one seaside town of some repute with holiday makers for five or six weeks in the summer, and dotted about the county there are three or four small old towns that seem drooping in a slow decay, sleepy and grey with age and forgetfulness. They remind me of what I have read of towns in the west of Ireland. Grass grows between the uneven stones of the pavements, the sides above the shop windows decline, Half the letters of these signs are missing. Here and there a house has been pulled down, or has been allowed to slide into ruin, and wild greenery springs up through the fallen stones, and there is silence in all the streets, and it is to be noted, these are not places that were once magnificent. The Celts have never had the art of building, and so far as I can see, such towns as Tewin and Marthel, Tevelt and Meiros must have been always much as they are now. Clusters of poorish, mainly built houses, ill-kept and down at hill. And these few towns are thinly scattered over a wild country where north is divided from south by a wilder mountain range. One of these places is sixteen miles from any station. The others are doubtfully and deviously connected by single-line railways served by rare trains that pause and stagger and hesitate on their slow journey up mountain passes, or stop for half an hour more at lonely sheds called stations, situated in the midst of desolate marshes. A few years ago, I travelled with an Irishman on one of these queer lines, and he looked to right and saw the bog with its yellow and blue grasses and stagnant pools, and he looked to left and saw a ragged hillside, set with grey stone walls. I can hardly believe, he said, that I'm not still in the wilds of Ireland. Here, then, one sees a wild and divided and scattered region, a land of outland hills and secret and hidden valleys, I know white farms on this coast which must be separate by two hours of hard, rough walking from any other habitation, which are invisible from any other house, and inland again. The farms are often ringed about by thick rows of ash, planted by men of old days to shelter their roof trees from rude winds of the mountain and stormy winds of the sea, so that these places, too, are hidden away, 
she be surmised only by the wood smoke that rises from the green surrounding leaves a londoner must see them to believe in them and even then he can scarcely credit their utter isolation such then in the main is merion and on this land in the early summer of last year terror descended a terror without shape such as no man there had ever known it began with the tale of a little child who wandered out into the lanes to pick flowers one sunny afternoon and never came back to the cottage on the hill End of chapter one chapter two death in the village the child who was lost came from a lonely cottage that stands on the slope of a steep hillside called the alt or the height the land about it is wild and ragged here the growth of gorse and bracken here a marshy hollow of reeds and rushes marking the course of the stream from some hidden well here thickets of dense and tangled undergrowth the outposts of wood down through this broken and uneven ground a path leads to the lane at the bottom of the valley then the land rises again and swells up to the cliffs over the sea about a quarter of a mile away the little girl gertrude morgan asked her mother if she might go down to the lane and pick up the purple flowers these were orchids that grew there and her mother gave her leave telling her that she must be back by tea time as there was apple tart for tea she never came back it was supposed that she must have crossed the road and gone to the cliff's edge possibly in order to pick the sea pinks that were then in full blossom she must have slipped they said and fallen into the sea two hundred feet below and it may be said at once that there was no doubt some truth in this conjecture though it stopped very short of the whole truth the child's body must have been carried out by the tide for it was never found the conjecture of a false step or of a fatal slide on the slippery turf that slopes down the rocks was accepted as the only explanation possible people thought the accident a strange one because as a rule the country children living by the cliffs and the sea became wary at an early age and gertrude morgan was almost ten years old still as the neighbors said that's how it must have happened and it's a great pity to be sure but this would not do when in a week's time a strong young laborer failed to come to his cottage after the day's work his body was found on the rock six or seven miles from the cliffs where the child was supposed to have fallen he was going home by a path that he had used every night of his life for eight or nine years when he used the dark of nights in perfect security knowing every inch of it the police asked if he drank but he was a teetotaler if he were subject to fits but he wasn't and he was not murdered for his wealth since agricultural laborers are not wealthy it was only possible again to talk of slippery turf and a false step but people began to be frightened then a woman was found with her neck broken at the bottom of a disused quarry near la Fehangel, in the middle of the country the false step theory was eliminated here for the quarry was guarded with a natural hedge of gorse bushes one would have to struggle to fight through sharp thorns to destruction in such a place as this and indeed the gorse bushes were broken as if some one had rushed furiously through them just above the place where the woman's body was found and this was strange there was a dead sheep lying beside her in the pit as if the woman and the sheep together had been chased over the brim of the quarry but chased by whom or by what and then there was a new form of terror this was in the region of the marshes under the mountain a man and his son a lad fourteen or fifteen set out early one morning to work and never reached the farm where they were bound their way skirted the marsh but it was broad firm and well metalled and it had been raised about two feet over the bog but when search was made in the evening of the same day phillips and his son were found dead in the marsh covered with black slime and pondweed 
and they lay some ten yards from the path which it would seem they must have left deliberately it was useless of course to look for tracks in the black ooze for if one threw a big stone into it a few seconds removed all marks of the disturbance the men who found the two bodies beat about the verges and purlieus of the marsh in hope of finding some trace of the murderers they went to and fro over the rising ground where the black cattle were grazing they searched the alder thickets by the brook but they discovered nothing most horrible of all these horrors perhaps was the affair of the highway a lonely and unfrequented by-road that winds for many miles on a high and lonely land here a mile from any other dwelling stands a cottage on the edge of a dark wood it was inhabited by a laborer named williams his wife and their three children one hot summer's evening a man who had been doing a day's gardening at the rectory three or four miles away passed the cottage and stopped for a few minutes to chat with williams the laborer who was pottering about his garden while the children were playing on the path by the door the two talked of their neighbors and of the potatoes till mrs williams appeared at the doorway and said supper was ready and williams turned to go into the house this was about eight o'clock and in the ordinary course the family would have their supper and be in bed by nine or by half-past nine at the latest at ten o'clock that night the local doctor was driving home along the highway his horse shied violently and then stopped dead just opposite the gate to the cottage the doctor got down frightened at what he saw and there on the roadway lay williams his wife and the three children stone dead all of them their skulls were battered in as if by some heavy iron instrument their faces were beaten to a pulp End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 The Doctor's Theory It is not easy to make any picture of the horror that lay dark on the hearts of the peoples of Marion. It was no longer possible to believe or to pretend to believe that these men and women and children had met their deaths through strange accidents. The little girl and the young laborer might have slipped and fallen over the cliffs, but the woman who lay dead with the dead sheep at the bottom of the quarry, the two men who had been lured into the ooze of the marsh, the family who were found murdered on the highway before their own cottage door. In these cases there could be no room for the supposition of accident. It seemed as if it were impossible to frame any conjecture or outline of a conjecture that would account for these hideous and, as it seemed, utterly purposeless crimes. For a time people said that there must be a madman at large, a sort of country variant of Jack the Ripper, some horrible pervert who was possessed by the passion of death, who prowled darkling about that lonely land, hiding in woods and in wild places, always watching and seeking for the victims of his desire. Indeed, Dr. Lewis, who found poor Williams, his wife and children, miserably slaughtered on the highway, was convinced at first that the presence of a concealed madman in the countryside offered the only possible solution to the difficulty. I felt sure, he said to me afterwards, that the Williams had been killed by a homicidal maniac. It was the nature of the poor creature's injuries that convinced me that this was the case. Some years ago, thirty-seven or thirty-eight years ago, as a matter of fact, I had something to do with a case which on the face of it had a strong likeness to the highway murder. At that time I had practice at Usk, in Monmouthshire. A whole family living in a cottage by the roadside were murdered one evening. It was called, I think, the Langibi murder. The cottage was near the village of that name. The murderer was caught in Newport. He was a Spanish sailor named Garcia, and it appeared that he had killed father, mother, and the three children for the sake of the brass works of an old Dutch clock which were found on him when he was arrested. Garcia had been serving a month's imprisonment at Usk jail for some small theft, and on his release, he set out to walk to Newport, nine or ten miles away, no doubt to get another ship. 
He passed the cottage and saw the man working in his garden. Garcia stabbed him with his sailor's knife. The wife rushed out. He stabbed her. Then he went into the cottage and stabbed the three children, tried to set the place on fire, and made off with the clockworks. That looked like the deed of a madman, but Garcia wasn't mad. They hanged him, I may say. He was merely a man of a very low type, a degenerate who hadn't the slightest value for human life. I am not sure, but I think he came from one of the Spanish islands, where the people are said to be degenerates, very likely from too much interbreeding. But my point is that Garcia stabbed to kill, and did kill, with one blow in each case. There was no senseless hacking and slashing. Now those poor people on the highway had their heads smashed to pieces by what must have been a storm of blows. Any one of them would have been fatal. But the murderer must have gone on raining blows with his iron hammer on people who were already stone dead. And that sort of thing is the work of a madman, and nothing but a madman. That's how I argue the matter out to myself just after the event. I was utterly wrong, monstrously wrong. But who could have suspected the truth? Thus, Dr. Lewis, and I quote him or the substance of him, as representative of most of the educated opinion of the district at the beginnings of the terror. People seized on this theory largely because it offered at least the comfort of an explanation. And any explanation, even the poorest, is better than an intolerable and terrible mystery. Besides, Dr. Lewis's theory was plausible. It explained the lack of purpose that seemed to characterize the murders. And yet, there were difficulties even from the first. It was hardly possible that a strange madman should be able to keep hidden in a countryside where any stranger is instantly noted and noticed. Sooner or later he would be seen as he prowled along the lanes or across the wild places. Indeed, a drunken, cheerful, and altogether harmless tramp was arrested by a farmer and his man in the fact and act of sleeping off beer under a hedge, but the vagrant was able to prove complete and undoubted alibis and was soon allowed to go on his wandering way. Then another theory, or rather a variant of Dr. Lewis's theory, was started. This was to the effect that the person responsible for the outrages was indeed a madman, but a madman only at intervals. It was one of the members of the Porth Club, a certain Mr. Remnant, who was supposed to have originated this more subtle explanation. Mr. Remnant was a middle-aged man who, having nothing particular to do, read a great many books by way of conquering the hours. He talked to the club, doctors, retired colonels, parsons, lawyers, about personality quoted various psychological textbooks in support of his contention that personality was sometimes fluid and unstable, went back to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as good evidence of this proposition, and laid stress on Dr. Jekyll's speculation that the human soul, so far from being one and indivisible, might possibly turn out to be a mere polity a state in which dwelt many strange and incongruous citizens, whose characters were not merely unknown, but altogether unsurmised by that form of consciousness which so rashly assumed that it was not only the president of the republic, but also its sole citizen. The long and the short of it is, Mr. Remnant concluded, that any one of us may be the murderer, though he hasn't the faintest notion of the fact. Take Llewellyn there. Mr. Payne Llewellyn was an elderly lawyer, a rural Tulkinghorn. He was the hereditary solicitor to the Morgans of Pentwyn. This does not sound anything tremendous to the Saxons of London, but the style is far more than noble to the Celts of West Wales. It is immemorial. Tilo Sant was of the collaterals of the first known chief of the race, and Mr. Payne Llewellyn did his best to look like the legal adviser of this ancient house. He was weighty, he was cautious, he was sound, he was secure. 
I have compared him to Mr. Tulkinghorn of Lincoln's Inn Fields, but Mr. Llewellyn would most certainly never have dreamed of employing his leisure in peering into the cupboards where the family skeletons were hidden. Supposing such cupboards to have existed, Mr. Payne Llewellyn would have risked large out-of-pocket expenses to furnish them with double, triple, impregnable locks. He was a new man, an advina, certainly, for he was partly of the conquest, being descended on one side from Sir Payne Turbeville, but he meant to stand by the old stock. "'Take Llewellyn now,' said Mr. Remnant. "'Look here, Llewellyn. Can you produce evidence to show where you were on the night those people were murdered on the highway? I thought not.' Mr. Llewellyn, an elderly man, as I have said, hesitated before speaking. "'I thought not,' Remnant went on. Now I say that it is perfectly possible that Llewellyn may be dealing death throughout Marion, although in his present personality he may not have the faintest suspicion that there is another Llewellyn within him, a Llewellyn who follows murder as a fine art. Mr. Payne Llewellyn did not at all relish Mr. Remnant's suggestion that he might well be a secret murderer, ravening for blood, remorseless as a wild beast. He thought the phrase about his following murder as a fine art was both nonsensical and in the worst taste, and his opinion was not changed when Remnant pointed out that it was used by De Quincey in the title of one of his most famous essays. "'If you had allowed me to speak,' he said with some coldness of manner, "'I would have told you that on Tuesday last, the night on which those unfortunate people were murdered on the highway,' I was staying at the Angel Hotel, Cardiff. I had business in Cardiff, and I was detained till Wednesday afternoon. Having given this satisfactory alibi, Mr. Payne Llewellyn left the club, and did not go near it for the rest of the week. Remnant explained to those who stayed in the smoking room that of course he had merely used Mr. Llewellyn as a concrete example of his theory which, he persisted, had the support of a considerable body of evidence. There are several cases of double personality on record, he declared, and I say again that it is quite possible that these murders may have been committed by one of us in his secondary personality. Why, I may be the murderer in my Remnant B state, though Remnant A knows nothing whatever about it, and is perfectly convinced that he could not kill a fowl much less a whole family. Isn't it so, Lewis? Dr. Lewis said it was so in theory, but he thought not, in fact. Most of the cases of double or multiple personalities that have been investigated, he said, have been in connection with the very dubious experiments of hypnotism or the still more dubious experiments of spiritualism. All that sort of thing, in my opinion, is like tinkering with the works of a clock, Amateur tinkering, I mean. You fumble about with the wheels and cogs and bits of mechanism that you don't really know anything about, and then you find your clock going backwards or striking 2.40 at tea time. And I believe it's just the same thing with these psychical research experiments. The secondary personality is very likely the result of the tinkering and fumbling with a very delicate apparatus that we know nothing about. Mind, I can't say that it's impossible for one of us to be the highway murderer in this B state, as Remnant puts it, but I think it's extremely improbable. Probability is the guide of life, you know, Remnant, said Dr. Lewis, smiling at that gentleman as if to say that he had also done a little reading in his day. And it follows, therefore, that improbability is also the guide of life. When you get a very high degree of probability, that is, you are justified in taking it as a certainty, and on the other hand, if a supposition is highly improbable, you are justified in treating it as an impossible one, that is, in 999 cases out of a thousand. How about the thousandth case, said Remnant, supposing these extraordinary crimes constitute the thousandth case? The doctor smiled and shrugged his shoulders, being tired of the subject. 
but for some little time highly respectable members of Porth society would look suspiciously at one another, wondering whether, after all, there mightn't be something in it. However, both Mr. Remnant's somewhat crazy theory and Dr. Lewis's plausible theory became untenable when two more victims of an awful and mysterious death were offered up in sacrifice. For a man was found dead in the Lanvihangel quarry where the woman had been discovered, and on the same day a girl of fifteen was found broken on the jagged rocks under the cliffs near Porth. Now it appeared that these two deaths must have occurred at about the same time, within an hour of one another certainly, and the distance between the quarry and the cliffs by Black Rock is certainly twenty miles. A motor could do it, one man said. But it was pointed out that there was no high road between the two places. Indeed, it might be said that there was no road at all between them. There was a network of deep, narrow, and tortuous lands that wandered into one another at all manner of queer angles for, say, seventeen miles. This in the middle, as it were, between Black Rock and the quarry at Lanvehangel. But to get to the high road at the cliffs, one had to take the path that went through two miles of fields, and the quarry lay a mile away from the nearest by-road in the midst of gorse and bracken and broken land. And finally there was no track of motor-car or motor-bicycle in the lanes which must have been followed to pass from one place to the other. "'What about an airplane, then?' said the man of the motor-car theory. Well, there was certainly an aerodrome not far from one of the two places of death, but somehow nobody believed that the Flying Corps harbored a homicidal maniac. It seemed clear, therefore, that there must be more than one person concerned in the terror of Marion, and Dr. Lewis himself abandoned his own theory. As I said to Remnant at the club, he remarked, improbability is the guide of life. I can't believe that there are a pack of madmen or even two madmen at large in the country. I give it up. And now a fresh circumstance or set of circumstances became manifest to confound judgment and to awaken new and wild surmises. For at about this time people realized that none of the dreadful events that were happening all about them was so much as mentioned in the press. I have already spoken of the fate of the Myros Observer, this paper was suppressed by the authorities because it had inserted a brief paragraph about some person who had been found dead under mysterious circumstances. I think that paragraph referred to the first death of Lanfehangel's quarry. Thenceforth, horror followed on horror, but no word was printed in any of the local journals. The curious went to the newspaper offices. There were two left in the county but found nothing save her firm refusal to discuss the matter. And the card of papers were drawn and found blank. And the London press was apparently ignorant of the fact that crimes that had no parallel were terrorizing a whole countryside. Everybody wondered what could have happened. What was happening? And then it was whispered that the coroner would allow no inquiry to be made as to these deaths of darkness. In consequence of instructions received from the Home Office, one coroner was understood to have said, I have to tell the jury that their business will be to hear the medical evidence and to bring in a verdict immediately in accordance with that evidence. I shall disallow all questions. One jury protested. The foreman refused to bring in any verdict at all. Very good, said the coroner. Then I beg to inform you, Mr. Foreman and gentlemen of the jury, that under the Defense of the Realm Act I have power to supersede your functions, and to enter a verdict according to the evidence which has been laid before the court, as if it had been the verdict of you all. The foreman and jury collapsed and accepted what they could not avoid, but the rumors that got abroad of all this added to the known fact that the terror was ignored in the press no doubt by official command, increased the panic that was now arising and gave it a new direction. Clearly, 
people reasoned, these government restrictions and prohibitions could only refer to the war, to some great danger in connection with the war, and that being so, it followed that the outrages which must be kept so secret were the work of the enemy, that is, of concealed German agents. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Spread of the Terror It is time, I think, for me to make one point clear. I began this history with certain references to an extraordinary accident to an airman whose machine fell to the ground after collision with a huge flock of pigeons, and then to an explosion in a northern munitions factory, an explosion, as I noted, of a very singular kind. Then I deserted the neighborhood of London and the northern district, and dwelt on a mysterious and terrible series of events which occurred in the summer of 1915 in a Welsh county, which I have named, for convenience, Marion. Well, let it be understood at once that all this detail that I have given about the occurrences in Marion does not imply that the county in the far west was alone or especially afflicted by the terror that was over the land. They tell me that in the villages about Dartmoor, the stout Devonshire hearts sank as men's hearts used to sink in the time of plague and pestilence. There was horror, too, about the Norfolk broads, and far up by Perth no one would venture on the path that leads by Scone to the wooded heights above the Tay. And in the industrial districts I met a man by chance one day in an odd London corner who spoke with horror of what a friend had told him. Ask no questions, Ned, he says to me, but I tell you, I was in Barnington the other day, and I met a pal who'd seen three hundred coffins going out of a works not far from there, and then the ship that hovered outside the mouth of the Thames with all sails set, and beat to and fro in the wind, and never answered any hail, and showed no light. The forts shot at her, and brought down one of the masts, but she went suddenly about with a change of wind under what sail still stood, and then veered down channel, and drove ashore at last on the sandbanks and pine woods of Arcachon, and not a man alive on her, but only rattling heaps of bones. That last voyage of the Semiramis would be something horribly worth telling, but I only heard it at a distance as a yarn, and only believed it because it squared with other things that I knew for certain. This, then, is my point. I have written of the terror as it fell on Marion, simply because I have had opportunities of getting close there to what really happened. Third or fourth or fifth hand in the other places, but round about Porth and Merthyr Tegveth, I have spoken with people who have seen the tracks of the terror with their own eyes. Well, I have said that the people of that far western county realized not only that death was abroad in their quiet lanes and on their peaceful hills, but that for some reason it was to be kept all secret. Newspapers might not print any news of it. The very juries summoned to investigate it were allowed to investigate nothing, and so they concluded that this veil of secrecy must somehow be connected with the war and from this position it was not a long way to a further inference that the murderers of innocent men and women and children were either Germans or agents of Germany. It would be just like the Huns, everybody agreed, to think out such a devilish scheme as this, and they always thought out their schemes beforehand. They hoped to seize Paris in a few weeks, but when they were beaten on the Marne, they had their trenches on the Asne ready to fall back on, it had all been prepared years before the war, and so, no doubt, they had devised this terrible plan against England in case they could not beat us in open fight. There were people ready, very likely all over the country, who were prepared to murder and destroy everywhere as soon as they got the word. In this way, the Germans intended to sow terror throughout England and fill our hearts with panic and dismay, hoping so to weaken their enemy at home that he would lose all heart over the war abroad. It was the Zeppelin notion, in another form. They were committing these horrible and mysterious outrages, thinking that we should be frightened out of our wits. It all seemed plausible enough, 
Germany had by this time perpetrated so many horrors, and had so excelled in devilish ingenuities, that no abomination seemed too abominable to be probable, or too ingeniously wicked to be beyond the tortuous malice of the Hun. But then came the questions as to who the agents of this terrible design were, as to where they lived, as to how they contrived to move unseen from field to field, from lane to lane. All sorts of fantastic attempts were made to answer these questions, but it was felt that they remained unanswered. Some suggested that the murderers landed from submarines, or flew from hiding places on the west coast of Ireland, coming and going by night. But there were seen to be flagrant impossibilities in both these suggestions. Everybody agreed that the evil work was no doubt the work of Germany, but nobody could begin to guess how it was done. Somebody at the club asked Remnant for his theory. My theory, said that ingenious person, is that human progress is simply a long march from one inconceivable to another. Look at that airship of ours that came over Porth yesterday. Ten years ago, that would have been an inconceivable sight. Take the steam engine. Stake printing. Take the theory of gravitation. They were all inconceivable till somebody thought of them. So it is, no doubt, with this infernal dodgery that we're talking about. The Huns have found it out, and we haven't. And there you are. We can't conceive how these poor people have been murdered, because the method's inconceivable to us. The club listened with some awe to this high argument. After Remnant had gone, one member said, Wonderful man, that! Yes, said Dr. Lewis. He was asked whether he knew something, and his reply really amounted to, no, I don't, but I have never heard it better put. It was, I suppose, at about this time when the people were puzzling their heads as to the secret methods used by the Germans or their agents to accomplish their crimes, that a very singular circumstance became known to a few of the Porth people. It related to the murder of the Williams family on the highway in front of their cottage door. I do not know that I have made it plain that the old Roman road called the highway follows the course of a long steep hill that goes steadily westward till it slants down and droops towards the sea. On either side of the road the ground falls away, here into deep shadowy woods, here to high pastures, now and again into a field of corn, but for the most part into the wild and broken land that is characteristic of our foam. The fields are long and narrow, stretching up the steep hillside. They fall into sudden dips and hollows, a well springs up in the midst of one, and a grove of ash and thorn bends over it, shading it, and beneath it the ground is thick, with reeds and rushes. And then may come on either side of such a field territories, glistening with the deep growth of bracken, and rough with gorse and rugged with thickets of blackthorn, green like and hanging strangely from the branches. Such are the lands on either side of the highway. Now on the lower slopes of it, beneath the Williams Cottage, some three or four fields down the hill, there is a military camp. The place has been used as a camp for many years, and lately the site has been extended and huts have been erected. But a considerable number of the men were under canvas here in the summer of 1915. On the night of the highway murder, this camp, as it appeared afterwards, was the scene of the extraordinary panic of the horses. A good many men in the camp were asleep in their tents soon after 9.30, when the last post was sounded. They woke up in panic. There was a thundering sound in the steep hillside above them, and down upon the tents came half a dozen horses, mad with fright, trampling the canvas, trampling the men, bruising dozens of them and killing, too. Everything was in wild confusion, men groaning and screaming in the darkness, struggling with the canvas and the twisted ropes, shouting out, some of them, raw lads enough, that the Germans had landed, others wiping the blood from their eyes, a few roused suddenly from heavy sleep, hitting out at one another, officers coming up at the double, roaring out orders to the sergeants, a party of soldiers who were just returning to camp from the village, seized with fright at what they could scarcely see or distinguish, at the wildness of the shouting and cursing and groaning that they could not understand, bolting out of the camp again and racing for their lives back to the village. 
everything in the maddest confusion of wild disorder. Some of the men had seen the horses galloping down the hill as if terror itself was driving them. They scattered off into the darkness, and somehow or another found their way back in the night to their pasture above the camp. They were grazing there peacefully in the morning, and the only sign of the panic of the night before was the mud they had scattered all over themselves as they pelted through a patch of wet ground. The farmers said they were as quiet a lot as any in Marion. He could make nothing of it. Indeed, he said, I believe they must have seen the devil himself to be in such a fright as that, save the people. Now all this was kept as quiet as might be at the time when it happened. It became known to the men of the Porth Club in the days when they were discussing the difficult question of the German outrages, as the murders were commonly called. And this wild stampede of the farm horses was held by some to be evidence of the extraordinary and unheard of character of the dreadful agency that was at work. One of the members of the club had been told by an officer who was in the camp at the time of the panic that the horses that came charging down were in a perfect fury of fright, that he had never seen horses in such a state, and so there was endless speculation as to the nature of the sight or the sound that had driven half a dozen quiet beasts into raging madness. Then in the middle of this talk, two or three other incidences, quite as odd and incomprehensible, came to be known, born on chance trickles of gossip that came into the towns from outland farms, or were carried by cottagers tramping into Porth on market day with a fowl or two and eggs and garden stuff, scraps and fragments of talk gathered by servants from the country folk and repeated to their mistresses. And in such ways it came out that up at Plas Newid, there had been a terrible business over swarming the bees. They had turned as wild as wasps, and much more savage. They had come about the people who were taking the swarms like a cloud. They settled on one man's face so that you could not see the flesh for the bees crawling all over it. And they had stung him so badly that the doctor did not know whether he would get over it. And they had chased a girl who had come out to see the swarming and settled on her and stung her to death. Then they had gone off to a break below the farm and got into a hollow tree there, and it was not safe to go near it, for they would come out at you by day or by night. And much the same thing had happened, it seemed, at three or four farms and cottages where bees were kept, and there were stories, hardly so clear or so credible, of sheepdogs, mild and trusted beasts, turning as savage as wolves and injuring the farm boys in a horrible manner. In one case, it was said, with fatal results. It was certainly true that old Mrs. Owen's favorite Brahma Dorking cock had gone mad. She came into Porth one Saturday morning with her face and her neck all bound up and plastered. She had gone out to her bit of a field to feed the poultry the night before, and the bird had flown at her and attacked her most savagely, inflicting some very nasty wounds before she could beat it off. There was a steak handy, lucky for me, she said, and I did beat him and beat him till the life was out of him. But what has come to the world, whatever? Now Remnant, the man of theories, was also a man of extreme leisure. It was understood that he had succeeded to ample means when he was quite a young man, and after tasting the savors of the law, as it were, for half a dozen terms at the board of the Middle Temple, he had decided that it would be senseless to bother himself with passing examinations for a profession which he had not the faintest intention of practicing. So he turned a deaf ear to the call of manger ringing through the temple courts and set himself out to potter amiably through the world. He had pottered all over Europe, he had looked at Africa, and had even put his head in a door of the east on a trip which included the Greek Isles and Constantinople. Now getting into the middle fifties, he had settled at Porth for the sake, as he said, of the Gulf Stream and the fuchsia hedges, and pottered over his books and his theories and the local gossip. He was no more brutal than the general public, which revels in the details of mysterious crime, but it must be said that the terror, black though it was, was a boon to him. 
he peered and investigated and poked about with the relish of a man whose life a new zest has been added. He listened attentively to the strange tales of bees and dogs and poultry that came into Porth with the country baskets of butter, rabbits, and green peas, and he evolved at last a most extraordinary theory. Full of this discovery, as he thought it, he went one night to see Dr. Lewis and take his view of the matter. "'I want to talk to you,' said Remnant to the doctor, "'about what I have called provisionally the Z-Ray.'" End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Incident of the Unknown Tree Dr. Lewis, smiling indulgently and quite prepared for some monstrous piece of theorizing, led Remnant into the room that overlooked the terraced garden and the sea. The doctor's house, though it was only ten minutes' walk from the center of the town, seemed remote from all other habitations. The drive to it from the road came through a deep grove of trees and a dense shrubbery. Trees were about the house on either side, mingling with neighboring groves, and below the garden fell down terrace by green terrace to wild growth, a twisted path amongst red rocks, and at last to the yellow sand of a little cove. The room to which the doctor took Remnant looked over these terraces and across the water to the dim boundaries of the bay. It had French windows that were thrown wide open, and the two men sat in the soft light of the lamp. This was before the days of severe lighting regulations in the far west, and enjoyed the sweet odors and the sweet vision of the summer evening. Then Remnant began. I suppose, Lewis, you've heard these extraordinary stories of bees and dogs and things that have been going about lately. Certainly I've heard them. I was called in at Plas Newid and treated Thomas Trevor, who's only just out of danger, by the way. I certified for the poor child, Mary Trevor. She was dying when I got to the place. There was no doubt she was stung to death by bees, and I believe there were other very similar cases at Lantarnum and Morwen. None fatal, I think. What about them? Well, then there are the stories of good-tempered old sheepdogs turning wicked and savaging children. Quite so. I haven't seen any of these cases professionally, but I believe the stories are accurate enough. And the old woman assaulted by her own poultry? That's perfectly true. Her daughter put some stuff of their own concoction on her face and neck, and then she came to me. The wound seemed going all right, so I told her to continue the treatment, whatever it might be. Very good, said Mr. Remnant. He spoke now with an italic impressiveness. Don't you see the link between all this and the horrible things that have been happening about here for the last month? Lewis stared at Remnant in amazement. He lifted his red eyebrows and lowered them in a kind of scowl. His speech showed traces of his native accent. Great burning, he exclaimed. What on earth are you getting at now? It is madness. Do you mean to tell me that you think there is some connection between a swarm or two of bees that have turned nasty, a cross dog, and a wicked old barn door cock? and these poor people that have been pitched over the cliffs and hammered to death on the road? There's no sense in it, you know. I am strongly inclined to believe that there is a great deal of sense in it, replied Remnant with extreme calmness. Look here, Lewis. I saw you grinning the other day at the club when I was telling the fellows that, in my opinion, all these outrages had been committed certainly by the Germans— but by some method of which we have no conception. But what I meant to say when I talked about inconceivables was just this, that the Williams and the rest of them have been killed in some way that's not in theory at all, not in our theory at all events, some way we've not contemplated, not thought of for an instant. Do you see my point? 
Well, in a sort of way. You mean there's an absolute originality in the method? I suppose that is so, but what next? Remnant seemed to hesitate, partly from a sense of the portentous nature of what he was about to say, partly from a sort of half-unwillingness to part with so profound a secret. Well, he said, you will allow that we have two sets of phenomena of a very extraordinary kind occurring at the same time. Don't you think that it's only reasonable to connect the two sets with one another? So the philosopher of Tenderden Steeple and the Goodwin Sands thought, certainly, said Lewis. But what is the connection? Those poor folks on the highway weren't stung by bees or worried by a dog. And horses don't throw people over cliffs or stifle them in marshes. No, I never meant to suggest anything so absurd. It is evident to me that in all these cases of animals turning suddenly savage, the cause has been terror, panic, fear. The horses that went charging into the camp were mad with fright, we know. And I say that in the other instances we have been discussing the cause was the same. The creatures were exposed to an infection of fear, and a frightened beast or bird or insect uses its weapons, whatever they may be. If, for example, there had been anybody with those horses when they took their panic, they would have lashed out at him with their heels. Yes, I dare say that that is so. Well? Well, my belief is that the Germans have made an extraordinary discovery. I've called it the Z-ray. You know that the ether is merely an hypothesis. We have to suppose that it's there to account for the passage of the Marconi current from one place to another. Now suppose that there is a psychic ether, as well as a material ether. Suppose that it is possible to direct irresistible impulses across this medium. Suppose that these impulses are towards murder or suicide. Then I think you have an explanation of the terrible series of events that have been happening in Marion for the last few weeks. And it is quite clear to my mind that the horses and the other creatures have been exposed to this Z-ray, and that it has produced on them the effect of terror, with ferocity as the result of terror. Now what do you say to that? Telepathy, you know, is well established. So is hypnotic suggestion. You have only to look in the Encyclopedia Britannica to see that, and suggestion is so strong in some cases as to be an irresistible imperative. Now don't you feel that putting telepathy and suggestion together, as it were, you have more than the elements of what I call the Z-ray? I feel myself that I have more to go on in making my hypotheses than the inventor of the steam engine had in making his hypotheses when he saw the lid of the kettle bobbing up and down. What do you say? Dr. Lewis made no answer. He was watching the growth of a new, unknown tree in his garden. The doctor made no answer to Remnant's question. For one thing, Remnant was profuse in his eloquence. He had been rigidly condensed in his history. And Lewis was tired of the sound of his voice. For another thing, he found the Z-ray theory almost too extravagant to be bearable, wild enough to tear patients to tatters. And then as the tedious argument continued, Lewis became conscious that there was something strange about the night. It was a dark summer night. The moon was old and faint, above the dragon's head across the bay, and the air was very still. It was so still that Lewis had noted that not a leaf stirred on the very tip of a high tree that stood out against the sky, and yet he knew that he was listening to some sound that he could not determine or define. It was not the wind in the leaves. It was not the gentle wash of the water of the sea against the rocks. That latter sound he could distinguish quite easily. But there was something else. It was scarcely a sound. It was as if the air itself trembled and fluttered, as the air trembles in a church when they open the great pedal pipes of the organ. 
The doctor listened intently. It was not an illusion. The sound was not in his own head, as he had suspected for a moment. But for the life of him, he could not make out whence it came or what it was. He gazed down into the night over the terraces of his garden, now sweet with the scent of the flowers of the night, tried to peer over the treetops across the sea toward the dragon's head. It struck him suddenly that this strange fluttering vibration of the air might be the noise of a distant aeroplane or airship. There was not the usual droning hum, but this sound might be caused by a new type of engine. A new type of engine? Possibly it was an enemy airship. Their range, it had been said, was getting longer. And Lewis was just going to call Remnant's attention to the sound, to its possible cause, and to the possible danger that might be hovering over them, when he saw something that caught his breath and his heart with wild amazement and a touch of terror. He had been staring upward into the sky and about to speak to Remnant. He had let his eyes drop for an instant. He looked down towards the trees in the garden and saw with utter astonishment that one had changed its shape in the few hours that had passed since the setting of the sun. There was a thick grove of ilexes bordering the lowest terrace, and above them rose one tall pine, spreading its head of sparse dark branches, dark against the sky. As Lewis glanced down over the terraces, he saw that the tall pine tree was no longer there. In its place there rose above the ilexes what might have been a greater ilex. There was the blackness of a dense growth of foliage rising like a broad and far-spreading and rounded cloud over the lesser trees. Here, then, was a sight wholly incredible, impossible. It is doubtful whether the process of the human mind in such a case has ever been analyzed and registered. It is doubtful whether it ever can be registered. It is hardly fair to bring in the mathematician, since he deals with absolute truth, so far as mortality can conceive absolute truth. But how would a mathematician feel if he were suddenly confronted with a two-sided triangle? I suppose he would instantly become a raging madman, and Lewis, staring wide-eyed and wild-eyed, at a dark and spreading tree which his own experience informed him was not there, felt for an instant that shock which should affront us all when we first realized the intolerable antinomy of Achilles and the tortoise. Common sense tells us that Achilles will flash past the tortoise almost with the speed of the lightning. The inflexible truth of mathematics assures us that till the earth boils and the heavens cease to endure, the tortoise must still be in advance, and thereupon we should, in common decency, go mad. We do not go mad, because by special grace we are certified that, in the final court of appeal, all science is a lie, even the highest science of all. And so we simply grin at Achilles and the tortoise, as we grin at Darwin, deride Huxley, and laugh at Herbert Spencer. Dr. Lewis did not grin. He glared into the dimness of the night at the great spreading tree that he knew could not be there, and as he gazed he saw that what at first appeared the dense blackness of foliage was fretted and starred with wonderful appearances of lights and colors. Afterwards he said to me, I remember thinking to myself, Look here, I am not delirious. My temperature is perfectly normal. I am not drunk. I only had a pint of graves with my dinner over three hours ago. I have not eaten any poisonous fungus. I have not taken an elonium lueni experimentally. So now then, what is happening? The night had gloomed over. Clouds obscured the faint moon and the misty stars. Lewis rose, with some kind of warning and inhibiting gesture to Remnant, who, he was conscious, was gaping at him in astonishment. He walked to the open French window, 
and took a pace forward onto the path outside and looked very intently at the dark shape of the tree. Down below the sloping garden, above the washing of the waves, he shaded the light of the lamp behind him by holding his hands on each side of his eyes. The mass of the tree, the tree that couldn't be there, stood out against the sky, but not so clearly now that the clouds had rolled up. Its edges, the limits of its leafage, were not so distinct. Lewis thought that he could detect some sort of quivering movement in it, though the air was at a dead calm. It was a night on which one might hold up a lighted match and watch it burn without any wavering or inclination of the flame. "'You know,' said Lewis, "'how a bit of burnt paper will sometimes hang over the coals before it goes up the chimney, and little worms of fire will shoot through it? It was like that. If you should be standing some distance away, just threads and hairs of yellow light I saw, and specks and sparks of fire, and then a twinkling of a ruby no bigger than a pinpoint, and a green wandering in the black, as if an emerald were crawling, and then little veins of deep blue. Woe is me, I said to myself in Welsh. What is all this color and burning? And then, at that very moment, there came a thundering rap at the door of the room inside, and there was my man telling me that I was wanted directly up at the garth, as old Mr. Trevor Williams had been taken very bad. I knew his heart was not worth much, so I had to go off directly and leave Remnant to make what he could of it all. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 Mr. Remnant's Z-Ray Dr. Lewis was kept some time at the garth. It was past twelve when he got back to his house. He went quickly to the room that overlooked the garden and the sea, and threw open the French window and peered into the darkness. There, dim indeed against the dim sky, but unmistakable, was the tall pine tree, with its sparse branches, high above the dense growth of the ilex trees. The strange boughs which had amazed him had vanished. There was no appearance now of colors or of fires. He drew his chair up to the open window and sat there gazing and wondering far into the night till brightness came upon the sea and sky, and the forms of the trees in the garden grew clear and evident. He went up to his bed at last filled with a great perplexity, still asking questions to which there was no answer. The doctor did not say anything about the strange tree to Remnant. When they next met, Lewis said that he had thought there was a man hiding amongst the bushes. This, in explanation of that warning gesture he had used, and of his going out into the garden and staring into the night. He concealed the truth, because he dreaded the remnant doctrine that would undoubtedly be produced. Indeed, he hoped that he had heard the last of the theory of the Z-Ray. But Remnant firmly reopened this subject. We were interrupted just as I was putting my case to you, he said, and to sum it all up it amounts to this, that the Huns have made one of the great leaps of science. They are sending suggestions, which amount to irresistible commands, over here, and the persons affected are seized with suicidal or homicidal mania. The people who were killed by falling over the cliffs or into the quarry probably committed suicide. And so with the man and the boy who were found in the bog. As to the highway case, you remember that Thomas Evans said that he stopped and talked to Williams on the night of the murder. In my opinion, Evans was the murderer. He came under the influence of the ray, became a homicidal maniac in an instant, snatched Williams' spade from his hand, and killed him and the others. The bodies were found by me on the road. It is possible that the first impact of the ray produces violent nervous excitement, which would manifest itself externally. Williams might have called to his wife to come and see what was the matter with Evans. The children would naturally follow their mother. It seems to me simple. And as for the animals, the horses, dogs, and so forth, they, as I say, were no doubt panic-stricken by the ray, and hence driven to frenzy. 
Why should Evans have murdered Williams instead of Williams murdering Evans? Why should the impact of the ray affect one and not the other? Why does one man react violently to a certain drug while it makes no impression on another man? Why is A able to drink a bottle of whiskey and remain sober, while B is turned into something very like a lunatic after he has drunk three glasses? It is a question of idiosyncrasy, said the doctor. Is idiosyncrasy Greek for, I don't know, asked Remnant? Not at all, said Lewis, smiling blandly. I mean that in some diatheses, whiskey, as you have mentioned whiskey, appears not to be pathogenic or at all events not immediately pathogenic. In other cases, as you very justly observed, there seems to be a very marked cachexia associated with the exhibition of the spirit in question, even in comparatively small doses. Under this cloud of professional verbiage, Lewis escaped from the club and from Remnant. He did not want to hear any more about that dreadful ray, because he felt sure that the ray was all nonsense. But asking himself why he felt this certitude in the matter, he had to confess that he didn't know. An aeroplane, he reflected, was all nonsense before it was made. And he remembered talking in the early 90s to a friend of his about the newly discovered X-rays. The friend laughed incredulously, evidently didn't believe a word of it, till Lewis told him that there was an article on the subject in the current number of the Saturday Review, whereupon the unbeliever said, Oh, is that so? Oh, really? I see. And was converted on the X-ray faith on the spot. Lewis, remembering this talk, marveled at the strange processes of the human mind, its illogical and yet all-compelling ergos, and wondered whether he himself was only waiting for an article on the Z-Ray in the Saturday Review to become a devout believer in the doctrine of remnant. But he wondered with far more fervor as to the extraordinary thing he had seen in his own garden with his own eyes, the tree that changed all its shape for an hour or two of the night, the growth of strange boughs, the apparition of secret fires among them, the sparkling of emerald and ruby lights, how could one fail to be afraid with great amazement at the thought of such a mystery? Dr. Lewis's thoughts were distracted from the incredible adventure of the tree by the visit of his sister and her husband. Mr. and Mrs. Merritt lived in a well-known manufacturing town of the Midlands, which was now, of course, a center of munition work. On the day of their arrival at Porth, Mrs. Merritt who was tired after the long, hot journey, went to bed early. And Merritt and Lewis went into the room by the garden for their talk and tobacco. They spoke of the year that had passed since their last meeting, of the weary dragging of the war, of friends that had perished in it, of the hopelessness of an early ending of all this misery. Lewis said nothing of the terror that was on the land. One does not greet a tired man who has come to a quiet, sunny place for relief from black smoke and work and worry with a tale of horror. Indeed, the doctor saw that his brother-in-law looked far from well, and he seemed jumpy. There was an occasional twitch of his mouth that Lewis did not like at all. Well, said the doctor, after an interval of silence and port wine, I am glad to see you here again. Porth always suits you. I don't think you're looking quite up to your usual form, but three weeks of Marian air will do wonders. Well, I hope it will, said the other. I'm not up to the mark. Things are not going well at Middlingham. Business is all right, isn't it? Yes, business is all right, but there are other things that are all wrong. We are living under a reign of terror, it comes to that. What on earth do you mean? Well, I suppose I may tell you what I know. It's not much. I didn't dare write it. But do you know that at every one of the munition works in Middlingham, and all about it, there's a guard of soldiers with drawn bayonets and loaded rifles day and night? Men with bombs, too, and machine guns at the big factories. 
German spies? You don't want Lewis guns to fight spies with, nor bombs, nor a platoon of men. I woke up last night. It was the machine gun at Bennington's Army Motor Works, firing like fury, and then bang, bang, bang. That was the hand bombs. But what against? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what is happening, Merritt repeated, and he went on to describe the bewilderment and terror that hung like a cloud over the great industrial city in the Midlands. How the feeling of concealment, of some intolerable secret danger that must not be named, was worse of all. A young fellow I know, he said, was on short leave the other day from the front, and he spent it with his people at Belmont. That's about four miles out of Middlingham, you know. Thank God, he said to me, I'm going back tomorrow. It's no good saying that the wiper's salient is nice, because it isn't. But it's a damn sight better than this. At the front, you know what you're up against, anyhow. At Middlingham, everybody has the feeling that we're up against something awful, and we don't know what. It's that that makes people inclined to whisper. There's terror in the air. Merritt made a sort of picture of the great town cowering in its fear of an unknown danger. People are afraid to go out about alone at nights in the outskirts. They make up parties at the stations to go home together if it's anything like dark, or if there are any lonely bits on their way. But why? I don't understand. What are they afraid of? Well, I told you about my being awakened up the other night with the machine guns at the motor works rattling away and the bombs exploding and making the most terrible noise. That sort of thing alarms one, you know. It's only natural. Indeed, it must be very terrifying. You mean, then, there is a general nervousness about, a vague sort of apprehension that makes people inclined to herd together? There's that, and there's more. People have gone out that have never come back. There were a couple of men in the train to home arguing about the quickest way to get to North End, a sort of outlying part of home where they both lived. They argued all the way out of Midlingham, one saying that the high road was the quickest, though it was the longest way. It's the quickest going because it's the cleanest going, he said. And the other chap fancied a shortcut across the fields by the canal. It's half the distance, he kept on. Yes, if you don't lose your way, said the other. Well, it appears they put an even half crown on it, and each was to try his own way when they got out of the train. It was arranged that they were to meet at the wagon in North End. I shall be at the wagon first, said the man, who believed in the shortcut. And with that he climbed over the stile and made off across the fields. It wasn't late enough to be really dark and a lot of them thought he might win the stakes. But he never turned up at the wagon, or anywhere else for the matter of that. What happened to him? He was found lying on his back in the middle of a field, some way from the path. He was dead. The doctors said he'd been suffocated. Nobody knows how. Then there have been other cases. We whisper about them at Midlingham, but we're afraid to speak out. Lewis was ruminating all this profoundly. Terror in Marion and terror far away in the heart of England. But at Middlingham, so far as he could gather from these stories of soldiers on guard, of crackling machine guns, it was a case of an organized attack on the munitioning of the army. He felt that he did not know enough to warrant his deciding that the terror of Marion and of Stratfordshire were one. Then Merritt began again. There's a queer story going about, when the door is shut, the curtains drawn, that is, as to a place right out in the country over the other side of Middlingham, on the opposite side to Dunwich. They've built one of the new factories out there, a great red brick town of sheds, they tell me it is, with a tremendous chimney. It's not been finished more than a month or six weeks. They plumped it down right in the middle of the fields, by the line, 
and they're building huts for the workers as fast as they can, but up to the present the men are billeted all about, up and down the line. About two hundred yards from this place there's an old footpath leading from the station and the main road up to the small hamlet on the hillside. Part of the way this path goes by a pretty large wood, most of it thick undergrowth. I should think there must be twenty acres of wood, more or less. As it happens, I used this path once long ago, and I can tell you it's a black place of nights. A man had to go this way one night. He got along all right till he came to the wood, and then he said his heart dropped out of his body. It was awful to hear the noises in that wood. Thousands of men were in it, he swears that. It was full of rustling and pattering of feet, trying to go dainty, and the crack of dead boughs lying on the ground as someone trod on them, and swishing of the grass, and some sort of chattering speech going on that sounded, so he said, as if the dead sat in their bones and talked. He ran for his life anyhow across the fields, over hedges, through brooks. He must have run by his tail ten miles out of his way before he got home to his wife, and beat at the door and broke in and bolted it behind him. There is something rather alarming about any wood at night, said Dr. Lewis. Merritt shrugged his shoulders. People say that the Germans have landed, and that they are hiding in underground places all over the country. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 The Case of the Hidden Germans Lewis gasped for a moment, silent in contemplation of the magnificence of rumour. The Germans already landed, hiding underground, striking by night, secretly, terribly, at the power of England, here was a conception which made the myth of the Russians a paltry fable, before which the legend of Mons was an ineffectual thing. It was monstrous. And yet, he looked steadily at Merritt, a square-headed, black-haired, solid sort of man. He had symptoms of nerves about him for the moment, certainly, but one could not wonder at that, whether the tales he told were true, or whether he merely believed them to be true. Lewis had known his brother-in-law for twenty years or more, and had always found him a sure man in his own small world. But then, said the doctor to himself, those men, if they once get out of the ring of that little world of theirs, they are lost. Those are the men that believed in Madame Blavatsky. Well, he said, what do you think yourself? The Germans landed and hiding somewhere about the country, there's something extravagant in the notion, isn't there? I don't know what to think. You can't get over the facts. There are the soldiers with their rifles and the guns at the works all over Staffordshire, and those guns go off. I told you I'd hurt them. Then who are the soldiers shooting at? That's what we ask ourselves at Middlingham. Quite so, I quite understand. It's an extraordinary state of things. It's more than extraordinary. It's an awful state of things. It's terror in the dark. And there's nothing worse than that. As that young fellow I was telling you about said, at the front you do know what you're up against. And people really believe that a number of Germans have somehow got over to England and have hid themselves underground. People say they've got a new kind of poison gas. Something that they dig underground places and make the gas air, and lead it by secret pipes into the shops. Others say that they throw gas bombs into the factories. It must be worse than anything they've used in France, from what the authorities say. The authorities? Do they admit that there are Germans in hiding about Midlandham? No, they call it explosions. But we know it isn't explosions. We know in the Midlands what an explosion sounds like and looks like. And we know that the people killed in these explosions are put into the coffins and the works. Their own relations are not allowed to see them. And so you believe in the German theory? If I do, it's because one must believe in something. Some say they've seen the gas. I heard that a man living in Dunwich saw it one night like a black cloud with sparks of fire in it floating over the tops of the trees by Dunwich Common. The light of an ineffable amazement came into Lewis's eyes. The night of Remnant's visit, the trembling vibration of the air, the 
dark tree that had grown in his garden since the setting of the sun the strange leafage that was starred with burning with emerald and ruby fires and all vanished away when he returned from his visit to the garth and such leafage had appeared as a burning cloud far in the heart of england what intolerable mystery what tremendous doom was signified in this but one thing was clear and certain that the terror of marion was also the terror of the midlands lewis made up his mind most firmly that if possible all this should be kept from his brother-in-law marriage had come to Porth as to a city of refuge from the horrors of Middleham. if it could be managed he should be spared the knowledge that the cloud of terror had gone before him and hung black over the western land lewis passed the port and sat in an even voice very strange indeed a black cloud with sparks of fire i can't answer for it you know it's only a rumour just so and you think or you're inclined to think that these and all the rest you've told me is to be put down to the hidden germans as i say because one must think something i quite see your point no doubt if it's true it's the most awful blow that has ever been dwelled at any nation in the whole history of man the enemy established now vitals but is it possible after all how could it have been worked Merritt told Lewis how it had been worked, or rather, how people said it had been worked. The idea, he said, was that it was a part, and a most important part, of the great German plot to destroy England and the British Empire. The scheme had been prepared years ago, some thought soon after the Franco-Prussian War. Moltke had seen that the invasion of England, in the ordinary sense of the term invasion, presented very great difficulties. The matter was constantly in discussion in the inland military and high political circles, and the general trend of opinion in these quarters was that at the best the invasion of England would involve Germany in the gravest difficulties and leave France in the position of the Tertius Galdens. This was the state of affairs when a very high Prussian personage was approached by the Swedish professor Uvelius thus merit and here i would say in parenthesis that this uvelius was by all accounts an extraordinary man considered personally and apart from his writings he would appear to have been a most amiable individual he was richer than the generality of swedes certainly far richer than the average university professor in sweden but his shabby green frock coat and his spattered furry hat was notorious in the university town where he lived no one laughed because it was well known that professor huvelius spent every penny of his private means and a large portion of his official stipend on works of kindness and charity he hid his hat in a garret someone said in order that others might be able to swell on the first floor it was told of him that he restricted himself to a diet of dry bread and coffee for a month in order that the poor woman of the streets dying of consumption might enjoy luxuries in hospital. And this was the man who wrote a treatise De Facinore Humano to prove the infinite corruption of the human race. Oddly enough, Professor Huvelius wrote the most cynical book in the world, Hobbes preaches rosy sentimentalism in comparison. With the very highest motives, he held that a very large part of human misery, misadventure, and sorrow was due to the false convention that the heart of man was naturally and in the main well disposed and kindly if not exactly righteous murderers thieves assassins violators and all the host of the abominable he says in one passage are created by the false pretence and foolish credence of human virtue a lion in a cage is a fierce beast indeed but what will he be if we declare him to be a lamb and open the doors of his den who will be guilty of the deaths of the men women and children whom he will surely devour save those who unlocked the cage and he goes on to show that kings and the rulers of the peoples could decrease the sum of human misery to a vast extent by acting on the doctrine of human wickedness war he declares which is one of the worst of evils, will always continue to exist. But a wise king will decide a brief war, 
rather than a lengthy one, a short evil rather than a long evil, and this not from the benignity of his heart towards his enemies, for we have seen that the human heart is naturally malignant, but because he desires to conquer, and to conquer easily, without a great expenditure of men or of treasure, knowing that if he can accomplish this feat, his people will love him and his crown will be secure. So he will wage brief victorious wars, and not only spare his own nation, but the nation of the enemy, since in a short war the loss is less on both sides than in a long war. And so from evil will come good. And how, ask Huvelius, as such wars to be waged? The wise prince, he replies, will begin by assuming the enemy to be infinitely corruptible and infinitely stupid, since stupidity and corruption are the chief characteristics of man. So the prince will make himself friends in the very councils of his enemy, and also amongst the populace, bribing the wealthy by proffering them the opportunity of still greater wealth, and winning the poor by swelling words, for, Contrary to the common opinion, it is the wealthy who are greedy of wealth, while the populace are to be gained by talking to them about liberty, the unknown God. And so much are they enchanted by the words liberty, freedom, and such like, that the wise can go to the poor, rob them of what little they have, dismiss them with a hearty kick, and win their hearts and their votes forever, if only they will assure them that the treatment which they have received is called liberty. Guided by these principles, says Hevelius, the wise prince will entrench himself in the country that he desires to conquer. Nay, with but little trouble, he may actually have literally throw his garrisons into the heart of the enemy country before war has begun. This is a long and tiresome parenthesis, but it is necessary as explaining the long tale which Merritt told his brother-in-law, he having received it from some magnate of the Midlands who had travelled in Germany. It is probable that the story was suggested in the first place by the passage from Huvelius which I have just quoted. Merritt knew nothing of the real Huvelius. He was all but a saint. He thought of the Swedish professor as a monster of iniquity, worse, as he said, than Nietzsche, meaning, no doubt, Nietzsche. So he told the story of how Huvelius had sold his plan to the Germans, a plan for filling England with German soldiers. Land was to be bought in certain suitable and well-considered places. Englishmen were to be bought as the apparent owners of such land, and secret excavations were to be made till the country was literally undermined. A subterranean Germany, in fact, was to be dug under selected districts of England. There were to be great caverns, underground cities, well-drained, well-ventilated, supplied with water, and in these places vast stores both of food and of munitions were to be accumulated, year after year, till the day dawned, and then, Warned in time, the secret garrison would leave shops, hotels, offices, villas, and vanish underground, ready to begin their work of bleeding England at the heart. That's what Hansen told me, said Merritt at the end of his long story. Hansen, head of the Buckley Iron and Steel Syndicate, he has been a lot in Germany. Well, said Louise, of course it may be so. If it is so, it is terrible beyond words. Indeed, he found something horribly plausible in the story. It was an extraordinary plan, of course, an unheard-of scheme, but it did not seem impossible. It was the Trojan horse on a gigantic scale. Indeed, he reflected, the story of the horse with the warriors concealed within it, which was dragged into the heart of Troy by the deluded Trojans themselves, might be taken as the prophetic parable of what had happened to England, if Hansen's theory were well founded. And this theory certainly squared with what one had heard of German preparations in Belgium and in France, and placements for guns ready for the invader, German manufactories, which were really German forts on Belgian soil, the caverns by the Aden, made ready for the cannon. Indeed, Lewis thought he remembered something about suspicious concrete tennis courts on the heights commanding London. But the German army hidden under English ground, 
It was a thought to chill the stoutest heart, and it seemed from that wonder of the burning tree that the enemy mysteriously and terribly present at Midlingham was present also in Marion. Lewis, thinking of the country as he knew it, of his wild and desolate hillsides, his deep woods, his wastes and solitary places, could not be confessed that no more fit region could be found for the deadly enterprise of secret men. Yet, he thought again, there was but little harm to be done in Marion to the armies of England or to their munitionment. They were working for panic terror. Possibly that might be so, but the camp under the highway? That should be their first project, and no harm had been done there. Lewis did not know that since the panic of the horses, men had died terribly in that camp, that it was now a fortified place, with a deep, broad trench, a thick tangle of savage barbed wire about it, and a machine gun planted at each corner. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of the Terror What Mr. Merritt Found Mr. Merritt began to pick up his health and spirits a good deal. For the first morning or two of his stay at the doctor's, he contented himself with a very comfortable deck chair close to the house, where he sat under the shade of an old mulberry tree beside his wife and watched the bright sunshine on the green lawns, on the creamy crests of the waves, on the headlands of that glorious coast, purple even from afar, with the imperial glow of the heather, on the white farmhouses gleaming in the sunlight, high over the sea, far from any turmoil, from any troubling of men. The sun was hot, but the wind breathed all the while gently, incessantly, from the east, and Merritt, who had come to this quiet place not only from dismay, but from the stifling and oily airs of the smoky midland town, said that this east wind, pure and clear, and like well water from the rock, was new life to him. He ate a capital dinner at the end of his first day at Porth, and took rosy views as to what they had been talking about the night before, he said to Lewis, no doubt there must be trouble of some sort, and perhaps bad trouble. Still, Kitchener would soon put it all right. So things went on very well. Merritt began to stroll about the garden, which was full of the comfortable spaces, groves, and surprises that only country gardens know. To the right of one of the terraces he found an arbor or summer house covered with white roses, and he was as pleased as if he had discovered the pole. He spent a whole day there smoking and lounging and reading a rubbishy sensational story, and declared that the Devonshire roses had taken many years off his age. Then on the other side of the garden there was a filbert grove that he had never explored on any of his former visits, and again there was a find. Deep in the shadow of the filberts was a bubbling well, issuing from rocks and all manner of green, dewy ferns growing about it and above it, and an angelica springing beside it. Merritt knelt on his knees and hollowed his hand and drank the well water. He said, over his port, that night that if all the water were like the water of the filbert well the world would turn to teetotalism it takes a townsman to relish the manifold and exquisite joys of the country it was not till he had begun to venture abroad that merritt found that something was lacking of the old rich peace that used to dwell in marion he had a favorite walk which he never neglected year after year this walk led along the cliffs towards miros and then one could turn inland and return to porth by deep winding lanes that went over the alt so Merritt set out early one morning and got as far as a sentry box at the foot of the path that led up to the cliff. There was a sentry pacing up and down in front of the box, and he called on Merritt to produce his pass or to turn back to the main road. Merritt was a good deal put out and asked the doctor about this strict guard, and the doctor was surprised. I didn't know they had put their bar up there, he said. I suppose it's wise. We are certainly in the far west here. Still, the Germans might slip round and raid us and do a lot of damage just because Marion is the last place we should expect them to go for. But there are no fortifications, surely on the cliff. Oh no, I never heard of anything of the kind there. Well, what's the point of forbidding the public to go on the cliff, then? I can quite understand putting a sentry on top to keep a lookout for the enemy. What I don't understand is a sentry at the bottom who can't keep a lookout for anything, as he can't see the sea, and why warn the public off the cliffs? I couldn't facilitate a German landing by standing on Pingareg, even if I wanted to. It is curious, the doctor agreed. Some military reasons, I suppose. He let the matter drop, perhaps because the matter did not affect him. People who live in the country all year round, country doctors certainly, are little given to desultory walking in search of the picturesque. Lewis had no suspicion that sentries whose object was equally obscure were being dotted all over the country. There was a sentry, for example, by the quarry at La Hafangal, where the dead woman and the dead sheep had been found some weeks before. 
The path by the quarry was used a good deal, and its closing would have inconvenienced the people of the neighborhood very considerably, but the sentry had his box by the side of the track, and had his orders to keep everybody strictly to the path, as if the quarry was a secret fort. It was not known till a month or two ago that one of these sentries was himself a victim of the terror. The men on duty at this place were given certain very strict orders, which from the nature of the case must have seemed to them unreasonable. For old soldiers, orders are orders, but here was a young bank clerk, scarcely in training for a couple of months, who had not begun to appreciate the necessity of hard, literal obedience to an order which seemed to him meaningless. He found himself on a remote and lonely hillside. He had not the faintest notion that his every movement was watched, and he disobeyed a certain instruction that had been given him. The post was found deserted by the relief. The sentry's dead body was found at the bottom of the quarry. This, by the way, for Mr. Merritt discovered again and again that things happened to hamper his walks and his wanderings. Two or three miles from Porth, there is a great marsh made by the Afon River before it falls into the sea, and here Merritt had been accustomed to botanize mildly. He had learned pretty accurately the causeways of solid ground that led to the sea of swamp and ooze and soft yielding soil, and he set out one hot afternoon determined to make a thorough exploration of the marsh, and this time to find that rare bog bean that he felt for sure must grow somewhere in its wide extent. He got into the by-road that skirts the marsh, and to the gate which he had always used for entrance. There was the scene as he had known it always, the rich growth of reeds and flags and rushes, the mild black cattle grazing on the islands of firm turf, the scented procession of the meadow sweet, the royal glory of the loose strife, flaming pennons, crimson and golden of the giant dock. But they were bringing out a dead man's body through the gate. A laboring man was holding open the gate on the marsh. Merritt, horrified, spoke to him and asked who it was and how it had happened. They do say he was a visitor at Porth. Somehow he had been drowned in the marsh, whatever. But it's perfectly safe. I've been all over it a dozen times. Well, indeed, we did always think so. If he did slip by accident, like, and fall into the water, it was not so deep. It was easy enough to climb out again. And this gentleman was quite young to look at him, poor man. And he has come to Marion for his pleasure and holiday and found his death in it. Did he do it on purpose? Is it suicide? They say he had no reasons to do that. Here the sergeant of police in charge of the party interposed, according to orders which he himself did not understand. A terrible thing, sir, to be sure, and a sad pity, and I am sure this is not the sort of sight you have come to see down in Marion this beautiful summer. So don't you think, sir, that it would have been more pleasant-like if you would leave us to the sad business of ours? I have heard many gentlemen staying in Porth say that there is nothing to beat the view from the hill over there, not in the whole of Wales. Everyone is polite in Marion, but somehow Merritt understood that, in English, the speech meant, move on. Merritt moved back to Porth. He was not in humor for any idle, pleasurable strolling after so dreadful a meeting with death. He made some inquiries in the town about the dead man, but nothing seemed known of him. It was said that he had been on his honeymoon, that he had been staying at the Porth Castle Hotel, but the people of the hotel declared that they had never heard of such a person. Merritt got the local paper at the end of the week. There was not a word of, in it of any fatal accident in the marsh. He met the sergeant of police in the street. That officer touched his helmet with the utmost politeness in the... Hope you are enjoying yourself, sir. Indeed, you do look a lot better already. But as to the poor man who was found drowned or stifled in the marsh, he knew nothing. The next day Merritt made up his mind to go to the marsh to see whether he could find anything to account for so strange a death. What he found was a man with an armlet standing by the gate. The armlet had the letters CW on it, which are understood to mean Coast Watcher. The watcher said he had strict instructions to keep everybody away from the marsh. Why? He didn't know. But some said that the river was changing its course since the new railway embankment was built, and the marsh had become dangerous to people who didn't know it thoroughly. Indeed, sir, he added, it is part of my orders not to set foot on the other side of that gate myself, not for one scraggend of a minute. Merrick glanced over the gate incredulously. The marsh looked as it always had. There was plenty of sound, hard ground to walk on. He could see the track that he used to follow as firm as ever. He did not believe in the story of the changing course of the river and Lewis said he had never heard of anything of the kind. But Merritt had put the question in the middle of general conversation. He had not led up to it from any discussion of the death in the marsh, and so the doctor was taken unawares. If he had known of the conversation in Merritt's mind between the alleged changing of the Afon's course and the tragical event in the marsh, no doubt he would have confirmed the official explanation. He was, above all things, anxious to prevent his sister and her husband from finding out that the invisible hand of terror that ruled at Migmingham was ruling also in Marion. 
Lewis himself had little doubt that the man who has found dead in the marsh had been struck down by the secret agency, whatever it was, that had already accomplished so much of evil. But it was a chief part of the terror that no one knew for certain that this or that particular event was to be ascribed to it. People do occasionally fall over cliffs through their own carelessness, and as the case of Garcia the Spanish sailor showed, cottagers and their wives and children are now and then the victims of savage and purposeless violence. Lewis had never wandered about the marsh himself, but Remnant had pottered around it and about it and declared that the man who met his death there, his name was never known, in port at all events, must either have committed suicide by deliberately lying prone in the ooze and stifling himself, or else must have been held down in it. There were no details available, so it was clear that the authorities had classified this death with the others. Still, the man might have committed suicide, or he might have had a sudden seizure and fallen in the slimy water face down and so on. It was possible to believe that case A or B or C was in the category of ordinary accidents or ordinary crimes, but it was not possible to believe that A and B and C were all in that category, and thus it was to the end, and thus it is now. We know that the terror reigned and how it reigned, but there were many dreadful events ascribed to its rule, about which there must always be room for doubt. For example, there was the case of the Mary Ann, the rowing boat which came to grief in so strange a manner, almost under Merritt's eyes. In my opinion, he was quite wrong in associating the sorry fate of the boat and her occupants with a system of signaling by flashlights, which he detected, or thought he detected, on the afternoon in which the Marianne was capsized. I believe his signaling theory to be all nonsense, in spite of the naturalized German governess who was lodging with her employers in the suspected house. But on the other hand, there is no doubt in my own mind that the boat was overturned and those in it drowned by the work of the terror. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Terror, The Light on the Water Let it be noted carefully that so far Merritt had not the slightest suspicion that the terror of Middlingham was quick over Marion. Lewis had watched and shepherded him carefully. He had let out no suspicion of what had happened in Marion. Before taking his brother-in-law to the club, he had passed round a hint among the members. He did not tell the truth about Middlingham. And here again is a point of interest that as the terror deepened, the general public cooperated voluntarily, and one would say almost subconsciously with the authorities in concealing what they knew from one another. But he gave out a desirable portion of the truth, that his brother-in-law was nervy, not by any means up to the mark, and that it was therefore desirable that he should be spared of the knowledge of the intolerable and tragic mysteries which were being enacted all about them. "'He knows about that poor fellow who is found in the marsh,' said Lewis." and he has a kind of vague suspicion that there is something out of the common about the case, but no more than that. A clear case of suggested, or rather commanded, suicide, said Remnant. I regard it as a strong confirmation of my theory. Perhaps so, said the doctor, dreading lest he might have to hear about the Z-ray all over again. But please don't let anything out to him. I want him to get built up thoroughly before he goes back to Middlingham. Then, on the other hand, Merritt was still as death about the doings of the Midlands. He hated to think of them, much more to speak of them, and thus, as I say, he and the men at the Porth Club kept their secrets from one another, and thus, from the beginning to the end of the terror, the links were not drawn together. In many cases, no doubt, A and B met every day and talked familiarly. It may be confidentially on other matters of all sorts, each having in his possession half of the truth, which he concealed from the other, so the two halves were never put together to make a whole. Merit, as the doctor guessed, had a kind of uneasy feeling. It scarcely amounted to a suspicion, as to the business of the marsh, chiefly because he thought the official talk about the railway embankment and the course of the river rank nonsense. But finding that nothing more happened, he let the matter drop from his mind and settled himself down to enjoy his holiday. He found to his delight that there were no sentries or watchers to hinder him from the approach to Larnack Bay, a delicious cove, a place where the ash grove and the green meadow and the glistening bracken sloped gently down to red rocks and firm yellow sands. Merritt remembered a rock that formed a comfortable seat, and here he established himself of a golden afternoon and gazed at the blue of the sea and the crimson bastions and bays of the coast as it bent inward to Sarnau, and swept out again southward to the odd-shaped promontory called the Dragon's Head. Merritt gazed on, amused by the antics of the porpoises, who were tumbling and splashing and gamboling a little way out at sea, charmed by the pure and radiant air that was so different from the oily smoke that often stood for heaven at Middlingham, and charmed, too, by the white farmhouses dotted here and there on the heights of the curving coast. Then he noticed a little rowboat at about two hundred yards from the shore. 
There were two or three people aboard. He could not quite make out how many, and they seemed to be doing something with a line. They were no doubt fishing, and Merritt, who disliked fish, wondered how people could spoil such an afternoon, such a sea, such pellucid and radiant air by trying to catch white, flabby, offensive, evil-smelling creatures that would be excessively nasty when cooked. He puzzled over this problem and turned away from it, to the contemplation of the crimson headlands. And then he says that he noticed that signaling was going on. Flashing lights of intense brilliance, he declares, were coming from one of those farms on the heights of the coast. It was as if white fire was sprouting from it. Merritt was certain, as the light appeared and disappeared, that some message was being sent, and he regretted that he knew nothing of heliography. Three short flashes, a long and very brilliant flash, then two short flashes. Marriott fumbled in his pocket for pencil and paper so that he might record these signals, and bringing his eyes down to the sea level, he became aware, with amazement and horror, that the boat had disappeared. All that he could see was some vague, dark object far to the westward, running out with the tide. Now it is certain, unfortunately, that the Marianne was capsized, and that two schoolboys and the sailor in charge were drowned. The bones of the boat were found amongst the rocks far along the coast, and the three bodies were also washed ashore. The sailor could not swim at all, the boys only a little, and it needs an exceptionally fine swimmer to fight against the outward suck of the tide as it rushes past Pinnegred Point. But I have no belief whatever in Marriott's theory. He held, and still holds for all I know, that the flashes of light which he saw coming from Penrith Hall, the farmhouse, oh, the height, had some connection with the disaster to the Marianne. When it was ascertained that a family were spending their summer at the farm, and that the governess was a German, though a long naturalized German, Merritt could not see that there was anything left to argue about, though there might be more details to discover. But in my opinion, all this was a mere mare's nest. The flashes of brilliant light were caused, no doubt, by the sun lighting up one window of the farmhouse after the other. Still, Merritt was convinced from the very first, even before the damning circumstance of the German governess was brought to light, and on the evening of the disaster, as Lewis and he sat together after dinner, he was endeavouring to put what he called the common sense of the matter to the doctor. "'If you hear a shot,' said Merritt, "'and you see a man fall, you know pretty well what killed him.' There was a flutter of wild wings in the room. A great moth beat to and fro and dashed itself madly against the ceiling, the walls, the glass bookcase. Then a sputtering sound, a momentary dimming of the lamp. The moth had succeeded in its mysterious quest. "'Can you tell me,' said Lewis, as if he were answering Merritt, "'why moths rush into the flame?' Lewis had put his question as to the strange habits of the common moth to Merritt with the deliberate intent of closing the debate on death by heliograph. The query was suggested, of course, by the incident of the moth and the lamp, and Lewis thought that he had said, Oh, shut up, in somewhat elegant manner. And in fact, Merritt looked dignified, remained silent, and helped himself to port. That was the end that the doctor had desired. He had no doubt in his own mind that the affair of the Marianne was but one more item in the long account of horrors that grew larger almost with every day, and he was in no humor to listen to wild and futile theories as to the manner in which the disaster had been accomplished. Here was a proof that the terror that there was upon them was mighty, not only by the land, but on the waters, for Lewis could not see that the boat had could have been attacked by any ordinary means of destruction. From Merritt's story it must have been in shallow water. The shore of Larnac Bay shelves very gradually, and the admiralty chart showed the depth of water two hundred yards out to be only two fathoms. This would be too shallow for a submarine, and it could not have been shelled, and it could not have been torpedoed. There was no explosion. The disaster might have been due to carelessness. Boys, he considered, will play the fool anywhere, even in a boat. But he did not think so. A sailor would have stopped them, and it may be mentioned that the two boys were, as a matter of fact, extremely steady, sensible young fellows, not in the least likely to play foolish tricks of any kind. Lewis was immersed in these reflections, having successfully silenced his brother-in-law. He was trying in vain to find some clue to the horrible enigma. The middling ham theory of a concealed German force hiding in places under the earth was extravagant enough, and yet it seemed the only solution that approached plausibility. But then again, even a subterranean German host would hardly account for this wreckage of a boat floating on a calm sea. And then what of the tree with the burning in it that had appeared in the garden there a few weeks ago, and the cloud with the burning in it that had shone over the trees of the Midland village? I think I have already written something of the probable emotions of the mathematician confronted suddenly with an undoubted two-sided triangle. I said, if I remember, that he would be forced, in decency, to go mad, and I believe that Lewis was very near to this point. 
He felt himself confronted with an intolerable problem that most instantly demanded solution, and yet, with the same breath as it were, denied the possibility of there being any solution. People were being killed in an inscrutable manner, by some inscrutable means day after day, and one asked why and how, and there seemed no answer. In the Midlands, where every kind of mutinotment was manufactured, the explanation of German agency was plausible, and even if the subterranean notion was to be rejected as savouring altogether too much of the fairy tale, or rather of the sensational romance, yet it was possible that the backbone of the theory was true. The Germans might have planted their agents in some way or another in the midst of our factories, but here in Marion, what serious effect could be produced by the casual and indiscriminate slaughter of a couple of schoolboys in a boat, of a harmless holiday-maker in a marsh? The creation of an atmosphere of terror and dismay. It was possible, of course, but it hardly seemed tolerable, in spite of the enormities of Louvain and of Lustiania. Into these meditations and into the still dignified silence of merit broke the rap on the door of Lewis's man and those words which harass the ease of the country doctor when he tries to take any ease. "'You're wanted in the surgery, if you please, sir.' Lewis bustled out and appeared no more that night. The doctor had been summoned to a little hamlet on the outskirts of Porth, separated from it by half a mile or three-quarters of the road. One dignifies, indeed, the settlement without a name and calling it a hamlet. It was a mere row of four cottages, built about a hundred years ago for the accommodation of the workers in a quarry long since disused. In one of these cottages, the doctor found a father and mother weeping and crying out to Dr. Bach, Dr. Bach, and two frightened children and one little body still and dead. It was the youngest of the three, little Johnny, and he was dead. The doctor found that the child had been asphyxiated. He felt the clothes. They were dry. It was not a case of drowning. He looked at the neck. There was no mark of strangling. He asked the father how it had happened, and father and mother weeping most lamentably declared that they had no knowledge of how their child had been killed, and that it was the people that had done it. The Celtic fairies were still malignant. Lewis asked what had happened that evening. Where had the child been? Was he with his brother and sister? Don't they know anything about it? Reduced into some sort of order from its original, piteous confusion, this is the story that the doctor gathered. All three children had been well and happy through the day. They had walked in with the mother, Mrs. Roberts, to Porth, on a marketing expedition in the afternoon. They had returned to the cottage, had had their tea, and afterwards played about on the road in front of the house. John Roberts had come home somewhat late from his work, and it was after dusk when the family sat down to supper. Supper over, the three children went out again to play with other children from the cottage next door, Mrs. Roberts telling them that they might have half an hour before going to bed. The two mothers came to the cottage gates at the same moment and called out to their children to come along and be quick about it. The two small families had been playing on the strip of turf across the road, just by the stile into the fields. The children ran across the road, all of them except Johnny Roberts. His brother Willie said that just as their mother called them, he heard Johnny cry out, Oh, what's that beautiful shiny thing over the stile? End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Child and the Moth the little Roberts ran across the road, up the path, and into the lighted room. Then they noticed that Johnny had not followed them. Mrs. Roberts was doing something in the back kitchen, and Mr. Roberts had gone out to the shed to bring in some sticks for the next morning's fire. Mrs. Roberts heard the children run in and went on with her work. The children whispered to one another that Johnny would catch it when their mother came out of the back room and found him missing, but they expected he would run in through the open door any minute. But six or seven, perhaps ten minutes passed, and there was no Johnny. Then the father and mother came into the kitchen together and saw that their little boy was not there. They thought it was some small piece of mischief, that the two other children had hidden the boy somewhere in the room, in the big cupboard, perhaps. "'What have you done with him, then?' said Mrs. Roberts. "'Come out, you little rascal, directly in a minute!' There was no little rascal to come out, and Margaret Roberts, the girl, said that Johnny had not come across the road with them. He must still be playing all by himself by the hedge." "'What do you let him stay like that for?' said Mrs. Roberts. "'Can I trust you for two minutes together? "'Indeed to goodness, you are all of you more trouble than you are worth.' She went to open the door. 
Johnny, come you in directly, or you will be sorry for it. Johnny! The poor woman called at the door. She went out to the gate and called there. Come you, little Johnny, come you bochin, there's a good boy. I do see you hiding there. She thought he must be hiding in the shadow of the hedge and that he would come across running and laughing. He was always such a happy little fellow to her across the road. But no little merry figure danced out of the gloom of the still dark night. It was all silence. It was then, as the mother's heart began to chill, though she still called cheerfully to the missing child, that the elder boy told how Johnny had said there was something beautiful by the stile, and perhaps he did climb over and he is running now about the meadow and has lost his way. The father got his lantern then, and the whole family went crying and calling about the meadow, promising cakes and sweets and a fine toy to poor Johnny if he would come to them. They found the little body under the ash grove in the middle of the field. He was quite still and dead, so still that a great moth had settled on his forehead, fluttering away when they lifted him up. Dr. Lewis heard this story. There was nothing to be done, little to be said to these most unhappy people. "'Take care of the two that you have left to you,' said the doctor as he went away. "'Don't let them out of your sight if you can help it. It is dreadful times that we are living in.' It is curious to record that all through these dreadful times the simple little season went through its accustomed course at Porth. The war and its consequences had somewhat thinned the numbers of the summer visitors. Still, a very fair contingent of them occupied the hotels and boarding houses and lodging houses, and bathed from the old-fashioned machines on one beach, or from the new-fashioned tents on the other, and sauntered in the sun, or lay stretched out in the shade under the trees that grow down almost to the water's edge. Porth never tolerated Ethiopians or shows of any kind on its sands, but the Rockets did very well that summer in their garden entertainment, given in the castle grounds, and the fit-up companies that came to the assembly rooms are said to have paid their bills to a woman and to a man. Porth depends very largely on its midland and northern custom, custom of a prosperous, well-established sort. People who think Llandedlo overcrowded and Colwyn Bay too raw and red and new come year after year to the placid old town in the southwest and delight in its peace. And, as I say, they enjoyed themselves much as usual there in the summer of 1915. Now and then they became conscious, as Mr. Merritt became conscious, that they could not wander about quite in the old way, but they accepted sentries and coast-watchers and people who politely pointed out the advantages of seeing the view from this point rather than from that as very necessary consequences of the dreadful war that was being waged. Nay, as a Manchester man said, after having been turned back from his favorite walk to Castell Koch, it was gratifying to think that they were so well looked after. So far as I can see, he added, there's nothing to prevent a submarine from standing out there by innocent and landing half a dozen men in a collapsible boat in any of these little coves. And pretty fools we should look, shouldn't we, with our throats cut on the sands, or carried back to Germany in the submarine? He tipped the coast watcher half a crown. That's right, lad, he said. You give us the tip. Now, here was the strange thing. The North Countryman had his thoughts on elusive submarines and German raiders. The watcher had simply received instructions to keep the people off Castech Koch fields without reason assigned. And there can be no doubt that the authorities themselves, while they marked out the fields as in the terror zone, gave their orders in the dark and were themselves profoundly in the dark 
as to the manner of slaughter that had been done there. For if they had understood what had happened, they would have understood also that their restrictions were useless. The Manchester man was warned off his walk about ten days after Johnny Roberts' death. The watcher had been placed at his post because, the night before, a young farmer had been found by his wife lying on the grass close to the castle, with no scar on him nor any mark of violence, but stone dead. The wife of the dead man, Joseph Craddock, finding her husband lying motionless on the dewy turf, went white and stricken up the path to the village and got two men who bore the body to the farm. Lewis was sent for and knew at once when he saw the dead man that he had perished in the way that the little Roberts boy had perished, whatever awful way that might be. Craddock had been asphyxiated, and here again there was no mark of a grip on the throat. It might have been a piece of work by Burke and Hare, the doctor reflected, a pitch pastor might have been clapped over the man's mouth and nostrils and held there. Then a thought struck him. His brother-in-law had talked of a new kind of poison gas that was said to be used against the munition workers in the Midlands. Was it possible that the deaths of the man and the boy were due to some such instrument? He applied his tests, but could find no trace of any gas having been employed. Carbonic acid gas? A man could not be killed with that in the open air. To be fatal, that required a confined space, such a position as the bottom of a huge vat or of a well. He did not know how Craddock had been killed. He confessed it to himself. He had been suffocated. That was all he could say. It seemed that the man had gone out at about half-past nine to look after some beasts. The field in which they were was about five minutes' walk from the house. He told his wife he would be back in a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes. He did not return, and when he had been gone for three quarters of an hour, Mrs. Craddock went out to look for him. She went into the field where the beasts were, and everything seemed all right, but there was no trace of Craddock. She called out. There was no answer. Now the meadow in which the cattle were pastured is high ground. A hedge divides it from the fields which fall gently down to the castle and the sea. Mrs. Craddock hardly seemed able to say why, having failed to find her husband among his beasts, she turned to the path which led to Castell Koch. She said at first that she had thought that one of the oxen might have broken through the hedge and strayed, and that Craddock had perhaps gone after it. And then, correcting herself, she said, There was that, and then there was something else that I could not make out at all. It seemed to me that the edge did look different from usual. To be sure, things do look different at night, and there was a bit of sea mist about, but somehow it did look odd to me, and I said to myself, Have I lost my way, then? She declared that the shape of the trees in the hedge appeared to have changed, and besides, it had a look as if it was lighted up somehow. And so she went on towards the stile to see what all this could be, and when she came near, everything was as usual. She looked over the stile and called, and hoped to see her husband coming towards her, or to hear his voice, but there was no answer. And glancing down the path, she saw, or thought she saw, some sort of brightness on the ground. A dim sort of light, like a bunch of glowworms in the edge bank. And so I climbed over the stile and went down the path, and the light seemed to melt away. And there was my poor husband lying on his back, saying not a word to me when I spoke to him and touched him. 
So for Lewis the terror blackened and became altogether intolerable, and others, he perceived, felt as he did. He did not know, he never asked, whether the men at the club had heard of these deaths of the child and the young farmer, but no one spoke of them. Indeed, the change was evident. At the beginning of the terror men spoke of nothing else. Now it had become all too awful for ingenious chatter or labored and grotesque theories. And Lewis had received a letter from his brother-in-law at Middlingham. It contained the sentence, I am afraid Fanny's health has not greatly benefited by her visit to Porth. There are still several symptoms I don't like at all. And this told him, in a phraseology that the doctor and Merritt had agreed upon, that the terror remained heavy in the Midland town. It was soon after the death of Craddock that people began to tell strange tales of a sound that was to be heard of nights about the hills and valleys to the northward of Porth. A man who had missed the last train from Miros had been forced to tramp ten miles between Miros and Porth, seems to have been the first to hear it. He said he got to the top of a hill by Trendenoch, somewhere between half-past ten and eleven, when he first noticed an odd noise that he could not make out at all. It was like a shout, a long, drawn-out, dismal wail coming from a great way off, faint with distance. He stopped to listen, thinking at first that it might be owls hooting in the woods. But it was different, he said, from that. It was a long cry, and then there was silence, and then it began over again. He could make nothing of it, and feeling frightened, he did not quite know of what. He walked on briskly and was glad to see the lights of Porth Station. He told his wife of this dismal sound that night, and she told the neighbors, and most of them thought it was all fancy, or drink, or the owls after all. But the night after, two or three people who had been to some small merrymaking in a cottage just off the Miros Road heard the sound as they were going home soon after ten. They, too, described it as a long, wailing cry, indescribably dismal in the stillness of the autumn night. Like the ghost of a voice, said one, as if it came up from the bottom of the earth, said another. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 At Treff Loin Farm let it be remembered again and again that all the while that the terror lasted there was no common stock of information as to the dreadful things that were being done. The press had not said one word upon it. There was no criterion by which the mass of the people could separate fact from mere vague rumor, no test by which ordinary misadventure or disaster could be distinguished from the achievements of the secret and awful force that was at work, and so with every event of the passing day. A harmless commercial traveller might show himself in the course of his business in the tumble-down main street of Miros, and find himself regarded with looks of fear and suspicion as a possible worker of murder, while it is likely enough that the true agents of the terror went quite unnoticed. And since the real nature of all this mystery of death was unknown, it followed easily that the signs and warnings and omens of it were all the more unknown. Here was horror. There was horror. But there was no links to join one horror with another, no common basis of knowledge from which the connection between this horror and that horror might be inferred. So there was no one who suspected at all that this dismal and hollow sound that was now heard of nights in the region to the north of Porth had any relation at all to the case of the little girl who went out one afternoon to pick purple flowers and never returned, 
or to the case of the man whose body was taken out of the peaty slime of the marsh or to the case of craddock dead in his fields with a strange glimmering of light about his body as his wife reported and it is a question as to how far the rumor of this melancholy nocturnal summons got abroad at all lewis heard of it as a country doctor hears of most things driving up and down lanes but he heard of it without much interest with no sense that it was in any sort of relation to the terror remnant had been given the story of the hollow and echoing voice of the darkness in a colored and picturesque form he employed a tredonoc man to work in his garden once a week the gardener had not heard the summons himself but he knew a man who had done so thomas junkins pentoppin he did put his head out late last night to see what the weather was like and he was cutting a field of corn the next day and he did tell me that when he was with the methodists in cardigan he did never hear no singing eloquence in the chapels that was like to it he did declare it was like a wailing of judgment day remnant considered the matter and was inclined to think that the sound must be caused by a subterranean inlet of the sea there might be he supposed an imperfect or half-opened or tortuous blowhole in the tredonoc woods and the noise of the tide surging up below might very well produce that effect of a hollow wailing far away but neither he nor any one else paid much attention to the matter save the few who heard the call at dead of night as it echoed awfully over the black hills the sound had been heard for three or perhaps four nights when the people coming out of tredonoc church after morning service on sunday noticed that there was a big yellow sheep-dog in the churchyard the dog it appeared had been waiting for the congregation for it at once attached itself to them at first to the whole body and then to a group of half a dozen who took the turning to the right two of these presently went off over the fields to their respective houses and four strolled on in the leisurely sunday morning manner of the country and these the dog followed keeping to heel all the time the men were talking hay corn and markets and paid no attention to the animal and so they strolled along the autumn lane till they came to a gate in the hedge whence a roughly made farm road went through the fields and dipped down into the woods and to treff loin farm then the dog became like a possessed creature he barked furiously he ran up to one of the men and looked up at him as if he were begging for his life as the man said and then rushed to the gate and stood by it wagging his tail and barking at intervals the men stared and laughed whose dog will that be said one of them it will be thomas griffith's trefloin said another well then why doesn't he go home go home then he went through the gesture of picking up a stone from the road and throwing it at the dog go home then over the gate with you but the dog never stirred he barked and whined and ran up to the men and then back to the gate at last he came to one of them and crawled and abased himself on the ground and then took hold of the man's coat and tried to pull him in the direction of the gate the farmer shook the dog off and the four went on their way and the dog stood in the road and watched them and then put up its head and uttered a long and dismal howl that was despair the four farmers thought nothing of it sheep dogs in the country are dogs to look after sheep and their whims and fancies are not studied but the yellow dog he was a kind of degenerate collie haunted the tredonoc lanes from that day he came to a cottage door one night and scratched at it and when it was opened lay down and then barking ran to the garden gate and waited entreating as it seemed the cottager to follow him they drove him away and again he gave that long howl of anguish it was almost as bad they said as the noise that they had heard a few nights before and then it occurred to somebody so far as i can make out 
with no particular reference to the odd conduct of the Trefloin sheepdog, that Thomas Griffith had not been seen for some time past. He had missed market day at Porth. He had not been seen at Tredonoc Church, where he was a pretty regular attendant on Sunday. And then, as heads were put together, it appeared that nobody had seen any of the Griffiths family for days and days. Now, in a town, even a small town, this process of putting heads together is a pretty quick business. In the country, especially in a countryside of wild lands and scattered and lonely farms and cottages, the affair takes time. Harvest was going on. Everybody was busy in his own fields. And after the long day's hard work, neither the farmer nor his men felt inclined to stroll about in search of news or gossip. A harvester at the day's end is ready for supper and sleep and for nothing else. And so it was late in that week when it was discovered that Thomas Griffith and all his house had vanished from this world. I have often been reproached for my curiosity over questions which are apparently of slight importance or of no importance at all. I love to inquire, for instance, into the question of the visibility of a lighted candle at a distance. Suppose, that is, a candle lighted on a still, dark night in the country. What is the greatest distance at which you can see that there is a light at all? And then, as to the human voice, what is its carrying distance, under good conditions, as a mere sound, apart from any matter of making out words that may be uttered? They are trivial questions, no doubt, but they have always interested me, and the latter point has its application to the strange business of Treff Loin. That melancholy and hollow sound, that wailing summons that appalled the hearts of those who heard it was, indeed, a human voice, produced in a very exceptional manner, and it seems to have been heard at points varying from a mile and a half to two miles from the farm. I do not know whether this is anything extraordinary. I do not know whether the peculiar method of production was calculated to increase or to diminish the carrying power of the sound. Again and again, I have laid emphasis in this story of the terror on the strange isolation of many of the farms and cottages in Marion. I have done so in the effort to convince the townsman of something that he has never known. To the Londoner, a house a quarter of a mile from the outlying suburban lamp, with no other dwelling within two hundred yards, is a lonely house, a place to fit with ghosts and mysteries and terrors. How can he understand, then, the true loneliness of the white farmhouses of Marion, dotted here and there, for the most part, not even on the little lanes and deep winding byways, but set in the very heart of the fields, or alone on huge bastioned headlands facing the sea, and, whether on the high verge of the sea, or on the hills, or in the hollows of the inner country, hidden from the sight of men, far from the sound of any common call. There is Penner Hall, for example, the farm from which the foolish Merritt thought he saw signals of light being made. From seaward it is, of course, widely visible, but from landward, owing partly to the curving and indented configuration of the bay, I doubt whether any other habitation views it from a nearer distance than three miles. And of all these hidden and remote places, I doubt if any is so deeply buried as Trefloin. I have little or no Welch, I am sorry to say, but I suppose that the name is corrupted from Trelwen, or Tref Ilwen, the place in the grove, and indeed it lies in the very heart of dark overhanging woods. A deep, narrow valley runs down from the highlands of the Alt, through these woods, through steep hillsides of bracken and gorse, right down to the great marsh, whence Merritt saw the dead man being carried. The valley lies away from any road, even from that by-road, little better than a bridle-path, where the four farmers, returning from church, were perplexed by the strange antics of the sheep-dog. One cannot say that the valley is overlooked, even from a distance, for so narrow is it 
that the ash groves that rim it on either side seem to meet and shut it in i at all events have never found any high place from which Trafloin is visible though looking down from the alt i have seen blue wood smoke rising from its hidden chimneys such was the place then to which one september afternoon a party went up to discover what had happened to griffith and his family there were a half a dozen farmers a couple of policemen and four soldiers carrying their arms those last had been lent by the officer commanding at the camp lewis too was of the party he had heard by chance that no one knew what had become of griffith and his family and he was anxious about a young fellow a painter of his acquaintance who had been lodging at Trafloin all the summer they all met by the gate of tredonoc churchyard and tramped solemnly along the narrow lane all of them i think with some vague discomfort of mind with a certain shadowy fear as of men who do not quite know what they may encounter lewis heard the corporal and the three soldiers arguing over their orders the captain says to me muttered the corporal don't hesitate to shoot if there's any trouble shoot what sir i says the trouble says he and that's all i could get out of him the men grumbled in reply lewis thought he heard some obscure reference to rat poison and wondered what they were talking about they came to the gate in the hedge where the farm road led down to Trefloin. they followed this track roughly made with grass growing up between its loosely laid stones down by the hedge from field to wood till at last they came to the sudden walls of the valley and the sheltering groves of the ash trees here the way curved down the steep hillside and bent southward and followed henceforward the hidden hollow of the valley under the shadow of the trees here was the farm enclosure the outlying walls of the yard and the barns and sheds and outhouses one of the farmers threw open the gate and walked into the yard and forthwith began bellowing at the top of his voice thomas griffith thomas griffith where be you thomas griffith the rest followed him the corporal snapped out an order over his shoulder and there was a rattling metallic noise as the men fixed their bayonets and became in an instant dreadful dealers out of death in place of harmless fellows with a feeling for beer thomas griffith again bellowed the farmer there was no answer to this summons but they found poor griffith lying on his face at the edge of the pond in the middle of the yard there was a ghastly wound in his side as if a sharp stake had been driven into his body end of chapter eleven chapter twelve the letter of wrath it was a still september afternoon no wind stirred in the hanging woods that were dark all about the ancient house of Trefloin. The only sound in the dim air was the lowing of the cattle. They had wandered, it seemed, from the fields, and had come in by the gate of the farmyard, and stood there melancholy, as if they mourned for their dead master. And the horses, four great, heavy, patient-looking beasts, they were there too, and in the lower field the sheep were standing, as if they waited to be fed you would think they all knew there was something wrong one of the soldiers muttered to another a pale sun showed for a moment and glittered on their bayonets they were standing about the body of poor dead griffith with a certain grimness growing on their faces and hardening there their corporal snapped something at them again they were quite ready lewis knelt down by the dead man and looked closely at the great gaping wound in his side he's been dead a long time he said a week two weeks perhaps he was killed by some sharp pointed weapon how about the family how many are there of them i never attended them there was griffith and his wife and his son thomas and mary griffith his daughter and i do think there was a gentleman lodging with them this summer that was from one of the farmers they all looked at one another this party of rescue who knew nothing of the danger that had smitten this house of quiet people nothing of the peril which had brought them to this pass of a farmyard with a dead man in it 
and his beasts standing patiently about him, as if they waited for the farmer to rise up and give them their food. Then the party turned to the house. It was an old sixteenth-century building with the singular round Flemish chimney that is characteristic of Marion. The walls were snowy with whitewash. The windows were deeply set and stone mullioned, and a solid stone-tiled porch sheltered the doorway from any winds that might penetrate to the hollow of that hidden valley. The windows were shut tight. There was no sign of any life or movement about the place. The party of men looked at one another, and the church warden amongst the farmers, the sergeant of police, Lewis, and the corporal drew together. "'What is it to goodness, doctor?' said the church warden. "'I can tell you nothing at all, except that that poor man there has been pierced to the heart,' said Lewis. "'Do you think they are inside, and they will shoot us?' said another farmer. He had no notion of what he meant by they, and no one of them knew better than he. They did not know what the danger was, or where it might strike them, or whether it was from without or from within. They stared at the murdered man, and gazed dismally at one another. "'Come,' said Lewis, "'we must do something. We must get into the house and see what is wrong.' "'Yes, but suppose they are at us while we are getting in,' said the sergeant. "'Where shall we be then, Dr. Lewis?' The corporal put one of his men by the gate at the top of the farmyard, another at the gate by the bottom of the farmyard, and told them to challenge and shoot. The doctor and the rest opened the little gate of the front garden and went up to the porch and stood listening by the door. It was all dead silence. Lewis took an ash stick from one of the farmers and beat heavily three times on the old black oaken door studded with antique nails. He struck three thundering blows, and then they all waited. There was no answer from within. He beat again, and still silence. He shouted to the people within, but there was no answer. They all turned and looked at one another. That party of quest and rescue who knew not what they sought, what enemy they were to encounter. There was an iron ring on the door. Lewis turned it, but the door stood fast. It was evidently barred and bolted. The sergeant of police called out to open, but again there was no answer. They consulted together. There was nothing for it but to blow the door open, and some one of them called in a loud voice to anybody that might be within to stand away from the door or they would be killed. And at this very moment the yellow sheepdog came bounding up the yard from the woods and licked their hands and fawned on them and barked joyfully. Indeed, now, said one of the farmers, he did know that there was something amiss. A pity it was, Thomas Williams, that we did not follow him when he implored us last Sunday. The corporal motioned the rest of the party back and they stood looking fearfully about them at the entrance to the porch. The corporal disengaged his bayonet and shot into the keyhole, calling out once more before he fired. He shot and shot again. So heavy and firm was the ancient door, so stout its bolts and fastenings. At last he had to fire at the massive hinges, and then they all pushed together, and the door lurched open and fell forward. The corporal raised his left hand and stepped back a few paces. He hailed his two men at the top and bottom of the farmyard. They were all right, they said, and so the party climbed and struggled over the fallen door into the passage and into the kitchen of the farmhouse. Young Griffith was lying dead before the hearth, before a dead fire of white wood ashes. They went on towards the parlor and in the doorway of the room was the body of the artist, Secretan, as if he had fallen in trying to get to the kitchen. Upstairs the two women, Mrs. Griffith and her daughter, a girl of eighteen, were lying together on the bed in the big bedroom, clasped in each other's arms. They went about the house, searched the pantries, the back kitchen, and the cellars. There was no life in it. Look, said Dr. Lewis, when they came back to the big kitchen. Look, it is as if they had been besieged. Do you see that piece of bacon 
half gnawed through then they found these pieces of bacon cut from the sides of the kitchen wall here and there about the house there was no bread in the place no milk no water and said one of the farmers they had the best water here in all marion the well is down there in the wood it is most famous water the old people did used to call it finan tilo it was saint tilo's well they did say they must have died of thirst said lewis they must have been dead for days and days the group of men stood in the big kitchen and stared at one another a dreadful perplexity in their eyes the dead were all about them within the house and without it and it was in vain to ask why they had died thus the old man had been killed with the piercing thrust of some sharp weapon the rest had perished it seemed probable of thirst but what possible enemy was this that besieged the farm and shut in its inhabitants there was no answer the sergeant of police spoke of getting a cart and taking the bodies into porth and dr lewis went into the parlor that secretan had used as a sitting-room intending to gather any possessions or effects of the dead artist that he might find there half a dozen portfolios were piled up in one corner there were some books on a side table a fishing rod and basket behind the door that seemed all no doubt there would be clothes and such matters upstairs and lewis was about to rejoin the rest of the party in the kitchen when he looked down at some scattered papers lying with the books on the side table on one of the sheets he read to his astonishment the words dr james lewis porth this was written in a staggering trembling scrawl and examining the other leaves he saw that they were covered with writing the table stood in a dark corner of the room and lewis gathered up the sheets of paper and took them to the window ledge and began to read amazed at certain phrases that had caught his eye but the manuscript was in disorder as if the dead man who had written it had not been equal to the task of gathering the leaves into their proper sequence it was some time before the doctor had each page in its place this was the statement that he read with ever-growing wonder while a couple of the farmers were harnessing one of the horses in the yard to a cart and the others were bringing down the dead women i do not think that i can last much longer we shared out the last drops of water a long time ago i do not know how many days ago we fall asleep and dream and walk about the house in our dreams and i am often not sure whether i am awake or still dreaming and so the days and nights are confused in my mind i awoke not long ago at least i suppose i awoke and found i was lying in the passage i had a confused feeling that i had had an awful dream which seemed horribly real and i thought for a moment what a relief it was to know that it wasn't true whatever it might have been i made up my mind to have a good long walk to refresh myself up and then i looked around and found that I had been lying on the stones of the passage, and it all came back to me. There was no walk for me. I have not seen Mrs. Griffith or her daughter for a long time. They said they were going upstairs to have a rest. I heard them moving about the room at first. Now I can hear nothing. Young Griffith is lying in the kitchen before the hearth. He was talking to himself about the harvest and the weather when I last went into the kitchen. He didn't seem to know I was there, as he went gabbling on in a low voice very fast, and then he began to call the dog Tiger. There seems no hope for any of us. We are in the dream of death. Here the manuscript became unintelligible for half a dozen lines. Secretan had written the words, Dream of Death, three or four times over. He had begun a fresh word and had scratched it out and then followed strange, unmeaning characters, the script, as Lewis thought, of a terrible language. And then the writing became clear, clearer than it was at the beginning of the manuscript, and the sentences flowed more easily, as if the cloud on Secretan's mind had lifted for a while. There was a fresh start, as it were, and the writer began again in ordinary letter form. Dear Lewis, 
I hope you will excuse all this confusion and wandering. I intended to begin a proper letter to you, and now I find all that stuff that you have been reading, if this ever gets into your hands. I have not the energy even to tear it up. If you read it, you will know to what a sad pass I had come when it was written. It looks like delirium or a bad dream, and even now, though my mind seems to have cleared up a good deal, I have to hold myself in tightly to be sure that the experiences of the last days in this awful place are true, real things, not a long nightmare from which I shall wake up presently and find myself in my rooms at Chelsea. I have said of what I am writing, if it ever gets into your hands, and I am not at all sure that it ever will. If what is happening here is happening everywhere else, then I suppose the world is coming to an end. I cannot understand it. Even now I can hardly believe it. I know that I dream such wild dreams and walk in such mad fancies that I have to look out and look about me to make sure that I am not still dreaming. Do you remember that talk we had about two months ago when I dined with you? We got on, somehow or other, to space and time, and I think we agreed that as soon as one tried to reason about space and time, one was landed in a maze of contradictions. You said something to the effect that it was very curious, but this was just like a dream. A man will sometimes wake himself from his crazy dream, you said, by realizing that he is thinking nonsense. And we both wondered whether these contradictions that one can't avoid if one begins to think of time and space may not really be proofs that the whole of life is a dream, and the moon and the stars bits of nightmare. I have often thought over that lately. I kick at the walls, as Dr. Johnson kicked at the stone, to make sure that the things about me are there. And then that other question gets into my mind. Is the world really coming to an end, the world as we have always known it? And what on earth will this new world be like? I can't imagine it. It's a story like Noah's Ark and the Flood. People used to talk about the end of the world and fire but no one ever thought of anything like this. And then there's another thing that bothers me. Now and then I wonder whether we are not all mad together in this house, in spite of what I see and know, or perhaps I should say, because what I see and know is so impossible, I wonder whether we are not all suffering from a delusion. Perhaps we are our own jailers, and we are really free to go out and live. Perhaps what we think we see is not there at all. I believe I have heard of whole families going mad together, and I may have come under the influence of the house, having lived in it for the last four months. I know there have been people who have been kept alive by their keepers, forcing food down their throats, because they are quite sure that their throats are closed, so that they feel they are unable to swallow a morsel. I wonder now and then whether we are all like this in Treff Loin, yet in my heart I feel sure that it is not so. Still, I do not want to leave a madman's letter behind me, and so I will not tell you the full story of what I have seen, or believe I have seen. If I am a sane man, you will be able to fill in the blanks for yourself from your own knowledge. If I am mad, burn the letter and say nothing about it. Or perhaps, and indeed I am not quite sure, I may wake up and hear Mary Griffith calling to me in her cheerful sing-song that breakfast will be ready directly in a minute, and I shall enjoy it and walk over to Porth and tell you the queerest, most horrible dream that a man ever had and ask what I had better take. I think that it was on a Tuesday that we first noticed that there was something queer about, only at the time we didn't know that there was anything really queer in what we noticed. I had been out since nine o'clock in the morning trying to paint the marsh, and I found it a very tough job. I came home about five or six o'clock and found the family at Trefloin laughing at old Tiger, the sheepdog. He was making short runs from the farmyard to the door of the house, barking, 
with quick short yelps mrs griffith and miss griffith were standing by the porch and the dog would go to them look in their faces and then run up the farmyard to the gate and then look back with that eager yelping bark as if he were waiting for the women to follow him then again and again he ran up to them and tugged at their skirts as if he would pull them by main force away from the house then the men came home from the fields and he repeated this performance the dog was running all up and down the farmyard in and out of the barn and sheds yelping barking and always with that eager run to the person he addressed and running away directly and looking back as if to see whether we were following him when the house door was shut and they all sat down to supper he would give them no peace till at last they turned him out of doors and then he sat in the porch and scratched at the door with his claws barking all the while when the daughter brought in my meal she said we can't think what has come to old tiger and indeed he has always been a good dog too the dog barked and yelped and whined and scratched at the door all through the evening they let him in once but he seemed to have become quite frantic he ran up to one member of the family after another his eyes were bloodshot and his mouth was foaming and he tore at their clothes till they drove him out again into the darkness then he broke into a long lamentable howl of anguish and we heard no more of him end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen the last words of mr secretan i slept ill that night i awoke again and again from uneasy m dreams and i seemed in my sleep to hear strange calls and noises and a sound of murmurs and beatings on the door there were deep hollow voices too that echoed in my sleep and when i woke i could hear the autumn wind mournful on the hills above us i started up once with a dreadful scream in my ears but then the house was all still and i fell again into uneasy sleep it was soon after dawn when i finally roused myself the people in the house were talking to each other in high voices arguing about something that i did not understand it is those damned gypsies i tell you said old griffith what would they do a thing like that for asked mrs griffith if it was stealing now it is more likely that john jenkins has done it out of spite said the son he said that he would remember you when we did catch him poaching they seemed puzzled and angry so far as i could make out but not at all frightened i got up and began to dress i don't think i looked out of the window the glass on my dressing-table is high and broad and the window is small one would have to poke one's head around the glass to see anything the voices were still arguing downstairs i heard the old man say well here's for a beginning anyhow and then the door slammed a minute later the old man shouted i think to his son then there was a great noise which i will not describe more particularly and a dreadful screaming and crying inside the house and a sound of rushing feet they all cried out at once to each other i heard the daughter crying it is no good mother he is dead indeed they have killed him and mrs griffith screaming to the girl to let her go and then one of them rushed out of the kitchen and shot the great bolts of oak across the door just as something beat against it with a thundering crash i ran downstairs i found them all in wild confusion in an agony of grief and horror and amazement they were like people who had seen something so awful that they had gone mad i went to the window looking out on the farmyard i won't tell you all that i saw but i saw poor old griffith lying by the pond with the blood pouring out of his side i wanted to go out to him and bring him in but they told me that he must be stone dead and such things also that it was quite plain that any one who went out of the house would not live more than a moment we could not believe it even as we gazed at the body of the dead man but it was there i used to wonder sometimes what one would feel like 
if one saw an apple drop from the tree and shoot up into the air and disappear. I think I know now how one would feel. Even then, we couldn't believe that it would last. We were not seriously afraid for ourselves. We spoke of getting out in an hour or two, before dinner anyhow. It couldn't last, because it was impossible. Indeed, at twelve o'clock, young Griffith said he would go down to the well by the back way and draw another pail of water. I went to the door and stood by it. He had not gone a dozen yards before they were on him. He ran for his life, and we had all we could do to bar the door in time. And then I began to get frightened. Still we could not believe in it. Somebody would come along shouting in an hour or two, and it would all melt away and vanish. There could not be any real danger. There was plenty of bacon in the house, and half the weekly baking of loaves, and some beer in the cellar, and a pound or two of tea, and a whole pitcher of water that had been drawn from the well the night before. We could do all right for the day, and in the morning it would have all gone away. But day followed day, and it was still there. I knew Treff Loin was a lonely place. That was why I had gone there, to have a long rest from all the jangle and rattle and turmoil of London that makes a man alive and kills him too. I went to Trefloin because it was buried in the narrow valley under the ash trees, far away from any track. There was not so much as a footpath that was near it. No one ever came that way. Young Griffith had told me that it was a mile and a half to the nearest house, and the thought of the silent peace and retirement of the farm used to be a delight to me. And now this thought came back without delight, with terror. Griffith thought that a shout might be heard on a still night up away on the alt, if a man was listening for it, he added doubtfully. My voice was clearer and stronger than his, and on the second night I said I would go up to my bedroom and call for help through the open window. I waited till it was all dark and still, and looked out through the window before opening it, and then I saw over the ridge of the long barn across the yard what looked like a tree, though I knew there was no tree there. It was a dark mass against the sky, with widespread boughs, a tree of thick, dense growth. I wondered what this could be, and I threw open the window, not only because I was going to call for help, but because I wanted to see more clearly what the dark growth over the barn really was. I saw in the depth of the dark of it points of fire and colors in light, all glowing and moving, and the air trembled. I stared out into the night, and the dark tree lifted over the roof of the barn and rose up in the air and floated towards me. I did not move till at the last moment when it was close to the house, and then I saw what it was and banged the window down only just in time. I had to fight, and I saw the tree that was like a burning cloud rise up in the night and sink again and settle over the barn. I told them downstairs of this. They sat with white faces. And Mrs. Griffith said that ancient devils were let loose and had come out of the trees and out of the old hills because of the wickedness that was on the earth. She began to murmur something to herself, something that sounded to me like broken down Latin. I went up to my room again an hour later but the dark tree swelled over the barn. Another day went by, and at dusk I looked out, but the eyes of the fire were watching me. I dared not open the window. And then I thought of another plan. There was the great old fireplace with the round Flemish chimney going high above the house. If I stood beneath it and shouted, I thought perhaps the sound might be carried better than if I called out of the window. For all I know, the round chimney might act as a sort of megaphone. Night after night, then, I stood in the hearth and called for help from nine o'clock to eleven. I thought of the lonely place deep in the valley of the ash trees, of the lonely hills and lands about it. I thought of the little cottages far away, 
and hoped that my voice might reach to those within them. I thought of the winding lane high on the alt, and of the few men that came there of nights, but I hoped that my cry might come to one of them. But we had drunk up the beer, and we would only let ourselves have water by little drops, and on the fourth night my throat was dry, and I began to feel strange and weak. I knew that all the voice I had in my lungs would hardly reach the length of the field by the farm. It was then we began to dream of wells and fountains, and water coming very cold, in little drops, out of rocky places in the middle of a cool wood. We had given up all meals. Now and then one would cut a lump from the sides of bacon on the kitchen wall and chew a bit of it, but the saltiness was like fire. There was a great shower of rain one night. The girl said we might open a window and hold out bowls and basins and catch the rain. I spoke of the cloud with burning eyes. She said, We will go to the window in the dairy at the back, and one of us can get some water at all events. She stood up with her basin on the stone slab in the dairy, and looked out, and heard the splashing of the rain falling very fast, and she unfastened the catch of the window, and had just opened it gently with one hand for about an inch, and had her basin in the other hand. And then, said she, there was something that began to tremble, and shudder, and shake, as it did when we went to the choral festival at St. Tiello's and the organ played, and there was the cloud and the burning close before me. And then we began to dream, as I say. I woke up in my sitting-room one hot afternoon, when the sun was shining, and I had been looking and searching in my dream all through the house, and I had gone down to the old cellar that wasn't used, the cellar with the pillars and the vaulted room, with an iron pike in my hand. Something said to me that there was water there, and in my dream I went to a heavy stone by the middle pillar and raised it up, and there beneath was a bubbling well of cold, clear water, and I had just hollowed my hand to drink it when I woke. I went into the kitchen and told young Griffith. I said I was sure there was water there. He shook his head, but he took up the great kitchen poker, and we went down to the old cellar. I showed him the stone by the pillar, and he raised it up but there was no well. Do you know I reminded myself of many people whom I have met in life? I would not be convinced. I was sure that, after all, there was a well there. They had a butcher's cleaver in the kitchen, and I took it down to the old cellar and hacked at the ground with it. The others didn't interfere with me. We were getting past that. We hardly ever spoke to one another. Each one would be wandering about the house, upstairs and downstairs, each one of us, I suppose, bent on his own foolish plan and mad design, but we hardly ever spoke. Years ago I was an actor for a bit, and I remember how it was on first nights, the actors treading softly up and down the wings, by their entrance, their lips moving and muttering over the words of their parts, but without a word for one another. So it was with us. I came upon young Griffith one evening, evidently trying to make a subterranean passage under one of the walls of the house. I knew he was mad, as he knew I was mad when he saw me digging for a well in the cellar. But neither said anything to the other. Now we are past all this. We are too weak. We dream when we are awake, and when we dream we think we wake. Night and day come and go, and we mistake one for another. I hear Griffith murmuring to himself about the stars when the sun is high at noonday, and at midnight I have found myself thinking that I walked in bright sunlit meadows beside cold rushing streams that flowed from high rocks. Then at the dawn figures in black robes carrying lighted tapers in their hands pass slowly about and about and I hear great rolling organ music that sounds as if some tremendous rite were to begin, and voices crying in an ancient song shrill from the depths of the earth. Only a little while ago I heard a voice which sounded as if it were at my very ears, but rang and echoed and resounded as if it were rolling 
and reverberated from the vault of some cathedral, chanting in terrible modulations. I heard the words quite clearly. Incipit liber ire domini de nostri. Here beginneth the book of the wrath of the Lord our God. And then the voice sang the word, Aleph, prolonging it, it seemed through ages, and a light was extinguished as it began the chapter. In that day, saith the Lord, there shall be a cloud over the land, and in the cloud a burning, and a shape of fire, and out of the cloud shall issue forth my messengers. They shall run all together, they shall not turn aside. This shall be a day of exceeding bitterness, without salvation. And on every high hill, saith the Lord of hosts, I will set my sentinels, and my armies shall encamp in the place of every valley. In the house that is amongst rushes I will execute judgment, and in vain shall they fly for refuge to the munitions of the rocks. In the groves of the trees, in the places where the leaves are as a tent above them, they shall find the sword of the slayer, and they that put their trust in walled cities shall be confounded. Woe unto the armed man! Woe unto him that taketh pleasure in the strength of his artillery! For a little thing shall smite him, and by one that hath no might shall he be brought down into the dust. That which is low shall be set on high. I will make the lamb and the young sheep to be as the lion from the swellings of Jordan. They shall not spare, saith the Lord, and the doves shall be as eagles on the hill and getty. None shall be found that may abide the onset of their battle. Even now I can hear the voice rolling far away, as if it came from the altar of a great church, and I stood at the door. There are lights very far away in the hollow of a vast darkness, and one by one they are put out. I hear a voice chanting again, with that endless modulation that climbs and aspires to the stars and shines there and rushes down to the dark depths of the earth again to ascend. The word is Zain. Here the manuscript lapsed again and finally into utter lamentable confusion. There were scrawled lines wavering across the page on which Secretan seemed to have been trying to note the unearthly music that swelled in his dying ears. As the scrapes and scratches of ink showed, he had tried hard to begin a new sentence. The pen had dropped at last out of his hand upon the paper, leaving a blot and a smear upon it. Lewis heard the tramp of feet along the passage. They were carrying out the dead to the cart. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The End of the Terror Dr. Lewis maintained that we should never begin to understand the real significance of life until we began to study just those aspects of it which we now dismiss and overlook as utterly inexplicable and therefore unimportant. We were discussing a few months ago the awful shadow of the terror which at length had passed away from the land. I had formed my opinion, partly from observation, partly from certain facts which had been communicated to me, and the passwords having been exchanged, I found that Lewis had come by very different ways to the same end. And yet, he said, it is not a true end, or rather, it is like all the ends of human inquiry. It leads one to a great mystery. We must confess that what has happened might have happened at any time in the history of the world. It did not happen until a year ago, as a matter of fact, and therefore we made up our minds that it could never happen, or one would better say it was outside the range even of imagination. But this is our way. Most people are not quite sure that the Black Death, otherwise the plague, will never invade Europe again. They have made up their complacent minds that it was due to dirt and bad drainage. As a matter of fact, the plague had nothing to do with dirt or with drains, and there is nothing to prevent its ravaging England tomorrow. But if you tell people so, they won't believe you. They won't believe in anything that isn't there at the particular moment 
when you are talking to them. As with the plague, so with the terror. We could not believe that such a thing could ever happen. Remnant said, truly enough, that whatever it was, it was outside theory, outside our theory. Flatland cannot believe in the cube or the sphere. I agreed with all this. I added that sometimes the world was incapable of seeing, much less believing, that which was before its own eyes. Look, I said, at any eighteenth-century print of a Gothic cathedral. You will find that the trained artistic eye even could not behold in any true sense the building that was before it. I have seen an old print of Peterborough Cathedral that looks as if the artist had drawn it from a clumsy model, constructed of bent wire and children's bricks. Exactly, because Gothic was outside the aesthetic theory, and therefore vision, of the time. You can't believe what you don't see. Rather, you can't see what you don't believe. It was so during the time of the terror. All this bears out what Coleridge said as to the necessity of having the idea before the facts could be of any service to one. Of course he was right. Mere facts, without the correlating idea, are nothing and lead to no conclusion. We had plenty of facts, but we could make nothing of them. I went home at the tail of that dreadful procession from Trefloin, in a state of mind very near to madness. I heard one of the soldiers saying to the other, "'There's no rat that'll spike a man to the heart, Bill.' I don't know why, but I felt that if I heard any more of such talk as that, I should go crazy. It seemed to me that the anchors of reason were parting. I left the party and took the shortcut across the fields into Porth. I looked up Davies in the high street and arranged with him that he should take on any cases I might have that evening, and then I went home and gave my man his instructions to send people on and then I shut myself up to think it all out, if I could. You must not suppose that my experiences of that afternoon had afforded me the slightest illumination. Indeed, if it had not been that I had seen poor old Griffith's body lying pierced in his own farmyard, I think I should have been inclined to accept one of Secretan's hints, and to believe that the whole family had fallen a victim to a collective delusion or hallucination, and had shut themselves up and died of thirst through sheer madness. I think there have been such cases. It's the insanity of inhibition, the belief that you can't do something which you are really perfectly capable of doing. But I had seen the body of the murdered man and the wound that had killed him. Did the manuscript left by Secretan give me no hint? Well, it seemed to me to make confusion worse confounded. You have seen it. You know that in certain places it is evidently mere delirium, the wanderings of a dying mind. How was I to separate the facts from the phantasms, lacking the key to the whole enigma? Delirium is often a sort of cloud castle a sort of magnified and distorted shadow of actualities. But it is a very difficult thing, almost an impossible thing, to reconstruct the real house from the distortion of it, thrown on the clouds of the patient's brain. You see, Secretan, in writing that extraordinary document, almost insisted on the fact that he was not in his proper sense, that for days he had been part asleep, part awake, part delirious. How was one to judge his statement, to separate delirium from fact? In one thing he stood confirmed. You remember he speaks of calling for help up the old chimney of Trefloin. That did seem to fit in with the tales of a hollow, moaning cry that had been heard upon the alt. So far one could take him as a recorder of actual experiences and I looked in the old cellars of the farm and found a frantic sort of rabbit hole dug by one of the pillars. Again he was confirmed. But what was one to make of that story of the chanting voice, and the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and the chapter out of some unknown minor prophet? When one has the key it is easy enough to sort out the facts, 
or the hints of facts from the delusions. But I hadn't the key on that September evening. I was forgetting the tree with lights and fires in it. That, I think, impressed me more than anything with the feeling that Secretan's story was, in the main, a true story. I had seen a like appearance down there in my own garden. But what was it? Now, I was saying that, paradoxically, it is only by the inexplicable things that life can be explained. We are apt to say, you know, a very odd coincidence, and pass the matter by, as if there were no more to be said, or as if that were the end of it. Well, I believe that the only real path lies through the blind alleys. What do you mean? Well, this is an instance of what I mean. I told you about Merritt, my brother-in-law, and the capsizing of that boat, the Mary Ann. He had seen, he said, signal lights flashing from one of the farms on the coast, and he was quite certain that the two things were intimately connected as cause and effect. I thought it all nonsense, and I was wondering how I was going to shut him up when a big moth flew into the room through that window, fluttered about, and succeeded in burning itself alive in the lamp. That gave me my cue. I asked Merritt if he knew why moths made for lamps or something of the kind. I thought it would be a hint to him that I was sick of his flashlights and his half-baked theories. So it was. He looked sulky and held his tongue. But a few minutes later I was called out by a man who had found his little boy dead in a field near his cottage about an hour before. The child was so still, they said, that a great moth had settled on his forehead and only fluttered away when they lifted up the body. It was absolutely illogical, but it was this odd coincidence of the moth in my lamp and the moth on the dead boy's forehead that first set me on the track. I can't say that it guided me in any real sense. It was more like a great flare of red paint on a wall. It rang up my attention, if I may say so. It was a sort of shock, like a bang on the big drum. No doubt Merritt was talking great nonsense that evening, so far as his particular instance went. The flashes of light from the farm had nothing to do with the wreck of the boat. But his general principle was sound. When you hear a gun go off and see a man fall, it is idle to talk of a mere coincidence. I think a very interesting book might be written on this question. I would call it A Grammar of Coincidence. But as you will remember from having read my notes on the matter, I was called in about ten days later to see a man named Craddock who had been found in a field near his farm quite dead. This also was at night. His wife found him, and there were some very queer things in her story. She said that the hedge of the field looked as if it were changed. She began to be afraid that she had lost her way and got into the wrong field. Then she said the hedge was lighted up, as if there were a lot of glowworms in it, and when she peered over the stile there seemed to be some kind of glimmering upon the ground, and then the glimmering melted away and she found her husband's body near where this light had been. Now, this man Craddock had been suffocated, just as the little boy Roberts had been suffocated, and as that man in the Midlands, who took a short cut one night, had been suffocated. Then I remembered that poor Johnny Roberts had called out about something shiny over the stile just before he played truant. Then, on my part, I had to contribute the very remarkable sight I witnessed here, as I looked down over the garden, the appearance as of a spreading tree where I knew there was no such tree, and then the shining and burning of lights and moving colors. Like the poor child and Mrs. Craddock, I had seen something shiny, just as some man in Stratfordshire had seen a dark cloud with points of fire in it floating over the trees and Mrs. Craddock thought that the shape of the trees in the hedge had changed. My mind almost uttered the word that was wanted, but you see the difficulties. This set of circumstances could not, so far as I could see, have any relation with the other circumstances of the terror. 
how could i connect all this with the bombs and machine guns of the midlands with the armed men who kept watch about the munition shops by day and night then there was the long list of people here who had fallen over the cliffs or into the quarry there were the cases of the men stifled in the slime of the marshes there was the affair of the family murdered in front of their cottage on the highway there was the capsized mary ann i could not see any thread that could bring all these incidents together they seemed to me to be hopelessly disconnected i could not make out any relation between the agency that beat out the brains of the williams and the agency that overturned the boat i don't know but i think it's very likely if nothing more had happened that i should have put the whole thing down as an unaccountable series of crimes and accidents which chanced to occur in marion in the summer of nineteen fifteen well of course that would have been an impossible standpoint in view of certain incidents in merritt's story still if one is confronted by the insoluble one lets it go at last if the mystery is inexplicable one pretends that there isn't any mystery that is the justification for what is called free thinking then came that extraordinary business of trefloin i couldn't put that on one side i couldn't pretend that nothing strange or out of the way had happened there was no getting over it or getting round it i had seen with my eyes that there was a mystery and a most horrible mystery i have forgotten my logic but one might say that trefloin demonstrated the existence of a mystery in the figure of death i took it all home as i have told you and sat down for the evening before it it appalled me not only by its horror but here again by the discrepancy between its terms old griffith so far as i could judge had been killed by the thrust of a pike or perhaps of a sharpened stake how could one relate this to the burning tree that had floated over the ridge of the barn it was as if i said to you here is a man drowned and here is a man burned alive show that each death was caused by the same agency and the moment that i left this particular case of trefloin and tried to get some light on it from other instances of the terror i would think of the man in the midlands who heard the feet of a thousand men rustling in the wood and their voices as if dead men sat up in their bones and talked and then i would say to myself and how about that boat overturned in a calm sea there seemed no end to it no hope of any solution it was i believe a sudden leap of the mind that liberated me from the tangle it was quite beyond logic i went back to that evening when merritt was boring me with his flashlights to the moth in the candle and to the moth on the forehead of poor johnny roberts there was no sense in it but i suddenly determined that the child and joseph craddock the farmer and the unnamed stratfordshire man all found at night all asphyxiated had been choked by vast swarms of moths i don't pretend even now that this is demonstrated but i'm sure it's true now suppose you encounter a swarm of these creatures in the dark suppose the smaller ones fly up your nostrils you will gasp for breath and open your mouth then suppose some hundreds of them fly into your mouth into your gullet into your windpipe what will happen to you you will be dead in a very short time choked asphyxiated but the moths would be dead too they would be found in the bodies the moths do you know that it is extremely difficult to kill a moth with cyanide of potassium take a frog kill it open its stomach there you will find its dinner of moths and small beetles and the dinner will shake itself and walk off cheerily to resume an entirely active existence no that is no difficulty well now i came to this i was shutting out all the other cases i was confining myself to those that came under the one formula i got to the assumption or conclusion whichever you like that certain people had been asphyxiated by the action of moths i had accounted for that extraordinary appearance 
of burning or colored lights that I had witnessed myself when I saw the growth of that strange tree in my garden. That was clearly the cloud with points of fire in it that the Stratfordshire man took for a new and terrible kind of poison gas. That was the shiny something that poor little Johnny Roberts had seen over the stile. That was the glimmering light that had led Mrs. Craddock to her husband's dead body. That was the assemblage of terrible eyes that had watched over Treff Loin by night. Once on the right track I understood all this, for coming into this room in the dark I have been amazed by the wonderful burning and the strange fiery colors of the eyes of a single moth as it crept up the pane of glass outside. Imagine the effect of myriads of such eyes, of the movement of these lights and fires in a vast swarm of moths, each insect being in constant motion while it kept its place in the mass. I felt that all this was clear and certain. Then the next step. Of course, we know nothing about moths, rather we know nothing of moth reality. For all I know, there may be hundreds of books which treat of moth and nothing but moth. But these are scientific books, and science only deals with surfaces. It has nothing to do with realities. It is impertinent if it attempts to do with realities. To take a very minor matter, we don't even know why the moth desires the flame, but we do know what the moth does not do. It does not gather itself into swarms with the object of destroying human life. But here, by the hypothesis, were cases in which the moth had done this very thing. The moth race had entered, it seemed, into a malignant conspiracy against the human race. It was quite impossible, no doubt. That is to say, it had never happened before, but I could see no escape from this conclusion. These insects, then, were definitely hostile to man. And then I stopped, for I could not see the next step, obvious though it seems to me now. I believe that the soldiers' scraps of talk on the way to Trefloin and back flung the next plank over the gulf. They had spoken of rat poison, of no rat being able to spike a man through the heart, and then suddenly I saw my way clear. If the moths were infected with hatred of men and possessed the design and the power of combining against him, why not suppose this hatred, this design, this power shared by other non-human creatures? The secret of the terror might be condensed into a sentence. The animals had revolted against men. Now the puzzle became easy enough. One only had to classify. Take the cases of the people who met their deaths by falling over cliffs or over the edge of quarries. We think of sheep as timid creatures who always ran away. But suppose sheep that don't run away. And after all, in reason, why should they run away? Quarry or no quarry, cliff or no cliff, what would happen to you if a hundred sheep ran after you instead of running from you? There would be no help for it. They would have you down and beat you to death or stifle you. Then suppose man, woman, or child near a cliff's edge or a quarry side and a sudden rush of sheep. Clearly there is no help. There is nothing for it but to go over. There can be no doubt that that is what happened in all these cases. And again, you know the country, and you know how a herd of cattle will sometimes pursue people through the fields in a solemn, stolid sort of way. They behave as if they wanted to close in on you. Townspeople sometimes get frightened and scream and run. You or I would take no notice, or at the utmost wave our sticks at the herd, which will stop dead or lumber off. But suppose they don't lumber off. The mildest old cow, remember, is stronger than any man. What can one man or half a dozen men do against half a hundred of these beasts no longer restrained by that mysterious inhibition which has made for ages the strong, the humble slaves of the weak? But if you are botanizing in the marsh, like that poor fellow who was staying at Porth, and forty or fifty young cattle gradually close round you, 
and refuse to move when you shout and wave your stick, but get closer and closer instead, and get you into the slime. Again, where is your help? If you haven't got an automatic pistol, you must go down and stay down, while the beasts lie quietly on you for five minutes. It was a quicker death for poor Griffith of Trefloin. One of his own beasts gored him to death with one sharp thrust of its horn into his heart. And from that morning those within the house were closely besieged by their own cattle and horses and sheep. And when those unhappy people within opened a window to call for help or to catch a few drops of rainwater to relieve their burning thirst, the cloud waited for them with its myriad eyes of fire. Can you wonder that Secretan's statement reads in places like mania? You perceive the horrible position of those people in Trefloin. Not only did they see death advancing on them, but advancing with incredible steps, as if one were to die not only in nightmare, but by nightmare. But no one in his wildest, most fiery dreams ever had imagined such a fate. I am not astonished that Secretan at one moment suspected the evidence of his own senses, at another surmised that the world's end had come. And how about the Williams, who were murdered on the highway near here? The horses were the murderers, the horses that afterwards stampeded the camp below. By some means which is still obscure to me, they lured that family into the road and beat their brains out. Their shod hoofs were the instruments of execution. And as for the Marianne, the boat that was capsized, I have no doubt that it was overturned by a sudden rush of the porpoises that were gambling about in the water of Lamac Bay. A porpoise is a heavy beast. Half a dozen of them could easily upset a light rowing boat. The munition works? Their enemy was rats. I believe that it has been calculated that in Greater London the number of rats is about equal to the number of human beings, that is, there are about seven millions of them. The proportion would be about the same in all the great centers of population. And the rat, moreover, is on occasion migratory in its habits. You can understand now that story of the Semiramis beating about the mouth of the Thames and at last cast away by Arcachon, her only crew dry heaps of bones. The rat is an expert boarder of ships, and so one can understand the tale told by the frightened man who took the path by the wood that led up from the new munition works. He thought he heard a thousand men treading softly through the wood and chattering to one another in some horrible tongue. What he did hear was the marshalling of an army of rats, their array before the battle. And conceive the terror of such an attack. Even one rat in a fury is said to be an ugly customer to meet. Conceive, then, the eruption of these terrible swarming myriads rushing upon the helpless, unprepared, astonished workers in the munition shops. There can be no doubt, I think, that Dr. Lewis was entirely justified in these extraordinary conclusions. As I say, I had arrived at pretty much the same end by different ways, but this rather as to the general situation. While Lewis had made his own particular study of those circumstances of the terror that were within his immediate purview as a physician in large practice in the southern part of Marion. Of some of the cases which he reviewed, he had, no doubt, no immediate or first-hand knowledge, but he judged these instances by their similarity to the facts which had come under his personal notice. He spoke of the affairs of the quarry at Lanthangel, on the analogy of the people who were found dead at the bottom of the cliffs near Porth, and he was no doubt justified in doing so. He told me that, thinking the whole matter over, he was hardly more astonished by the terror in itself than by the strange way in which he had arrived at his conclusions. You know, he said, those certain evidences of animal malevolence which we knew of, the bees that stung the child to death, the trusted sheep-dogs turning savage, and so forth. 
Well, I got no light whatever from all this. It suggested nothing to me, simply because I had not got that idea which Coleridge rightly holds necessary in all inquiry. Facts, qua facts, as we said, mean nothing, and come to nothing. You do not believe, therefore you cannot see. And then, when the truth at last appeared, it was through the whimsical coincidence, as we call such signs, of the moth in my lamp and the moth on the dead child's forehead. This, I think, is very extraordinary. And there seems to have been one beast that remained faithful, the dog at Treff Loin. That is strange. That remains a mystery. It would not be wise even now to describe too closely the terrible scenes that were to be seen in the munition areas of the north and the midlands during the black months of the terror. Out of the factories issued at black midnight the shrouded dead in their coffins, and their very kinsfolk did not know how they had come by their deaths. All the towns were full of houses of mourning, were full of dark and terrible rumors, incredible as the incredible reality. There were things done and suffered that perhaps never will be brought to light. Memories and secret traditions of these things will be whispered in families, delivered from father to son, growing wilder with the passage of the years, but never growing wilder than the truth. It is enough to say that the cause of the Allies was for a while in deadly peril. The men at the front called in their extremity for guns and shells. No one told them what was happening in the places where these munitions were made. At first the position was nothing less than desperate. Men in high places were almost ready to cry mercy to the enemy. But after the first panic, measures were taken such as those described by Merritt in his account of the matter. The workers were armed with special weapons. Guards were mounted. Machine guns were placed in position. Bombs and liquid flame were ready against the obscene hordes of the enemy, and the burning clouds found a fire fiercer than their own. Many deaths occurred amongst the airmen, but they too were given special guns, arms that scattered shot broadcast, and so drove away the dark flights that threatened the airplanes. And then, in the winter of 1915 to 16, the terror ended suddenly as it had begun. Once more, a sheep was a frightened beast that ran instinctively from a little child. The cattle were again solemn, stupid creatures, void of harm. The spirit and the convention of malignant design passed out of the hearts of all the animals. The chains that they had cast off for a while were thrown again about them. And finally, there comes the inevitable why. Why did the beasts who had been humbly and patiently subject to man, or affrighted by his presence, suddenly know their strength, and learn how to league together, and declare bitter war against their ancient master. It is a most difficult and obscure question. I give what explanation I have to give with very great diffidence, and an eminent disposition to be corrected, if a clearer light can be found." Some friends of mine, for whose judgment I have very great respect, are inclined to think that there was a certain contagion of hate. They hold that the fury of the whole world at war, the great passion of death that seems driving all humanity to destruction, infected at last these lower creatures, and in place of their native instinct of submission, gave them rage and wrath and ravening. This may be the explanation. I cannot say that it is not so, because I do not profess to understand the working of the universe, but I confess that the theory strikes me as fanciful. There may be a contagion of hate, as there is a contagion of smallpox. I do not know, but I hardly believe it. In my opinion, and it is only an opinion, the source of the great revolt of the beasts is to be sought in a much subtler region of inquiry. I believe that the subjects revolted because the king abdicated. Man has dominated the beast throughout the ages. The spiritual has reigned over the rational through the peculiar quality 
and grace of spirituality that men possess, that makes a man to be that which he is. And when he maintained this power and grace, I think it is pretty clear that between him and the animals there was a certain treaty and alliance. There was supremacy on the one hand and submission on the other. But at the same time there was between the two that cordiality that exists between lords and subjects in a well-organized state. I know a socialist who maintains that Chaucer's Canterbury Tells give a picture of true democracy. I do not know about that, but I see that Knight and Miller were able to get on quite pleasantly together, just because the Knight knew that he was a Knight, and the Miller knew that he was a Miller. If the Knight had had conscientious objections to his knightly grade, while the Miller saw no reason why he should not be a Knight, I am sure that their intercourse would have been difficult unpleasant, and perhaps murderous. So with man. I believe in the strength and truth of tradition. A learned man said to me a few weeks ago, when I have to choose between the evidence of tradition and the evidence of a document, I always believe the evidence of tradition. Documents may be falsified, and often are falsified. Tradition is never falsified. This is true, and therefore I think one may put trust in the vast body of folklore which asserts that there was once a worthy and friendly alliance between man and the beasts. Our popular tale of Dick Whittington and his cat no doubt represents the adaptation of a very ancient legend to a comparatively modern personage. But we may go back into the ages and find the popular tradition asserting that not only are the animals the subjects, but also the friends of man. All that was in virtue of that singular spiritual element in man which the rational animals do not possess. Spiritual does not mean respectable. It does not even mean moral. It does not mean good in the ordinary acceptation of the word. It signifies the royal prerogative of man, differentiating him from the beasts. For long ages he has been putting off this royal robe. He has been wiping the balm of consecration from his own breast. He has declared again and again that he is not spiritual but rational, that is, the equal of the beasts over whom he was once sovereign. He has vowed that he is not Orpheus but Caliban, but the beasts have also within them something which corresponds to the spiritual quality in men. We are content to call it instinct. They perceived that the throne was vacant. Not even friendship was possible between them and the self-deposed monarch. If he were not king, he was a sham, an impostor, a thing to be destroyed. Hence, I think, the terror. They have risen once— they may rise again. End of chapter 14. End of The Terror by Arthur Mackin.